so welcome everyone this is a special meeting of the alice springs village council it's monday april twenty seventh and the purpose of this meeting is to meet with our utility electric consultant john courtney for a presentation on rate study that he did for our electric utility judy would you please call the roll yes wintro here asking yes sims here house here mcqueen here also present our village manager patty bates assistant village manager john young sorry never like moment and um... supervisor electric and water distribution johnny burns okay and everyone i'm not sure exactly um... obviously he has a powerpoint i'm thinking that maybe we can do how do you feel about questions as you're presenting? I mean, is it because sometimes with these kind of in-depth things, it's a little bit easier to ask questions sure, at the time. Fine. Okay, well we'll see how it goes. Um, everybody, just turn off your cell phones. I think that's probably the only warning we need. Oh, and our our uh, station manager needs to turn off her cell phone apparently. <laughs> um, so, John, welcome. Well, first, I'm going to move down to this end so I don't have my back to anyone and block the view of anyone, if that's okay with everybody. Or is the volume going to work? Oh, I'm sorry. I think it will. Yeah, I mean, actually, he we can probably use Judy's. Use Judy's. She won't be talking very <coughs> much. There you go. All Perfect. Right. Um, and by the way, I, I've got... Uh, oh. All right. Don't get back with me. We'll start saying. <laughs> <laughs> I've got Scott Wigan from our office here uh, with me tonight as well, and uh, so if there's any typos on the slides, you get to blame Scott. So uh, uh, you asked us to actually address a couple of different issues tonight. So we're going to, and unless you prefer otherwise, we suggest that we do them in this order. We've got Power Supply 101. I think somebody had asked uh, a while back to have us come in and, and kind of update you on your power supply arrangements and how they work uh, and the various resources that you have, and that's the first presentation I've got up. Um, secondly, you've hired us to do a, uh, an electric rate and cost of service study, uh, and while it's not quite yet complete, we at least want to give you an update on that, and, uh, and actually we'll be looking for some feedback from you uh, with regard to where we're at in that process. Won't necessarily need that feedback tonight, necessarily, but uh, certainly before we complete the study. And the last item is uh, community solar. Uh, I know there's been a lot of discussion about community solar. I've actually attended a couple of those meetings myself. Uh, and so I've got some slides to uh, discuss some of the options for community solar. So, uh, so with that, and, and, and certainly if you have questions, I don't have a problem as we go. Um, so let's start with Power Supply 101. I always like to start off with uh, some abbreviations and, and definitions just so that everybody uh, is on the same page because this industry that, that we work in is, uh, is known for its acronyms and, uh, and abbreviations. So, uh, and the first one up there, both alphabetically, but probably one of the most important in your power supply is American Municipal Power, or referred to as AMP. AMP is a, uh, uh, now a regional power supply agency that represents uh, publicly owned electric utilities throughout uh, uh, a large portion of the Midwest, actually all the way to the East Coast, to Delaware. Um, uh, they actually have uh, uh, members now. So um, when I started in this business back in, Geez, 1981, uh, they had about uh, oh, 50 or 60 members. They're now at 130 plus uh, members. And basically, AMP manages your power supply arrangements for you, uh, as I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. Uh, but as I said, they're probably one of the, one of the most important items on this list. Uh, WASG, or what we call the Western AMP Service Group, is a group of municipalities like yourself that have their own electric utility that are connected to Dayton Power and Light. Um, uh, basically, the, and again, I'll explain a little bit later, you've got a pooling arrangement that you, uh, with AMP that includes all of those. Uh, and those would be towns like Tip City, uh, to the north of you, um, Salina, Piqua, um, you know, El Dorado, you know, I'm going to get pretty small, Arcanum. Uh, so those are some of the other communities that are part of that Western uh, AMP service group. Uh, DPNL, obviously, is Dayton Power and Light. Uh, that's the utility that you're physically connected to. Uh, and you receive your power over Dayton Power and Light's uh, transmission and distribution system. Uh, RTO is basically what's referred to as a regional transmission organization. And about a decade or about better than a decade ago now, um, we've had, the, prior to that, the control of the transmission grid was basically done independently by each utility that owned transmission facilities. So Dayton Power and Light operated their own transmission grid. 
Uh, AEP, for example, it used to be Ohio Power and Columbus Southern, separate companies, had their own transmission grid. The companies to the northern part of the state, like Toledo Edison, Cleveland Electric Illuminating, Ohio Edison, all operated kind of independently, uh, as well as utilities in other states. But that all changed some time back, and now uh, transmission grids are operated by regional transmission organizations, independent entities. They don't own transmission, but the people who do own transmission basically allow the RTO to tell them kind of how to operate their transmission system. And that's, that's kind of a, a simplified version of it because it gets a lot more complicated, as you'll see. Mm. Um, but they also have expanded that authority to not only uh, kind of manage or, or control the transmission grid, but they also manage the generation facilities. In fact, they, and they manage the energy market. Uh, so it's much broader than just uh, an independent uh, entity kind of saying who gets to use the transmission grid and when. Part of the reason by the way that was formed was because of that, because when we had separate utilities owning and operating the transmission system, they could kind of limit your ability to get power from other sources. Um, uh, and they did this, you know, uh, to basically keep you as a captive customer. So, mm -hmm. so it was a good thing to, to create these, but we found out there's a lot of things <laughs> that, you know, that go along with it, as again, I'll, I'll kind of explain. Uh, they, uh, yeah, go ahead. They're a nonprofit organization. Or yes, they're not a... for profit. They're um, they're basically uh, controlled or operated or managed by um, you know by staff. But they're basically you have a board at the seat if you're a member. And so obviously Dayton Power and Light and the AP, okay. APs are all members of that. And then they elect board members mm -hmm. who kind of you know like a big corporation. Uh, but they basically uh, they really the, the big utilities are still setting the rules when it really gets right down okay. to it. So, so it's not a nonprofit. Yes, it it's is. Non it is. Yes. But yes. Okay. Not a nonprofit, but staffed. Not for profit. But not for profit. Okay. The board yeah. is chosen by f all the big, for mostly for profit electrical That's correct. utilities. That's correct. Unfortunately, the smaller utilities like yourself really don't have a lot of control of what, of how they set right. their rules. So. Right. Does AMP have a seat? Uh, AMP does not have a seat on the board. They're a member. In fact, they are your your representative as a member. You don't actually have direct membership to, to uh, the RTO. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the next bullet is, is the one that you're connected to, which is called PJM or PJM Interconnect. Uh, that's who Dayton Power and Light's transmission system is is in, the PJM mm -hmm. Interconnect. And so by default, since you're connected to DPNL, you're connected to uh, PJM, and, they, and you operate basically uh, under their rules. So. Right. And maybe just to be clear, I think most people here know, but people out there might not know that AMP is a not-for-profit uh, cooperative. <clears throat> it's like an energy co-op. Um, it's helpful for people to realize that. Yeah, it's that. a good point. I, I kind of skipped over that. But yeah, they are not-for-profit as well. They represent you. Uh, I, I kind of liken it to the, being a member of the lodge. I mean, and you're, you're, it's, it's basically you're all in it together. Uh, mm -hmm. And their goal is to basically assist their members and, and manage, you know, their, their needs, and in particular in power supply. They do some other services as well, uh, energy efficiency, for example, uh, which you're a part of. Uh, they do other member services, safety programs, uh, mutual aid program, which, uh, which you're a part of. Uh, but they are, for, they are not for profit like, like a Dayton Power and Light or an AEP. Right. Uh, you know, basically, whatever they take in goes back out, you know, to cover costs. So. Well, I think that covers most of the uh, abbreviations that I'll probably be using. Um, when we talk about power supply requirements for, for the village's electric system, we, li we basically break it into two components. We have to consider two separate items. Uh, the first being energy, which is what most of you at home obviously you know, think about, that you consume electricity over a period of time, whether it be over an hour or a day or a month. And that's usually expressed as kilowatt hours, or kWh, or megawatt hours, mWh. Uh, and so that'd be similar to what you, you have at your house. But in, in the wholesale market or in the RTO market, we also have to consider peak load uh, or what we call demand. Uh, and that's the peak rate of usage. That's how fast the power is used or, or what rate it's being used at. Um, and that's expressed in kilowatts or KW or megawatts, uh, MW. So, uh, and I just put down here just is a reference that one megawatt hour is basically equal to 1,000 kilowatt hours. So, or one megawatt's equal to, to 1,000 kilowatts. Now, with regard to energy, uh, for Yellow Springs, you can see here historically what your energy requirements have been in the last three years. Uh, right around 33,000 megawatt hours or 33 million kilowatt hours, if we, if we talk in terms of kilowatt hours. 
Uh, and by the way, I forgot to mention before I started, I, I do need to give credit where credit's due. Several of these slides were actually prepared by AMP. They allowed us to, to utilize those for this presentation. And you'll see, in fact, I think there's a couple where you might even see their, uh, their name or logo on them. So, uh, so I do want to give them credit. And this is one that we borrowed from them. Um, AMP is projecting or forecasting your 2015 energy requirements at 33 million, uh, 33,000 kilowatt hours or 33,000, 33 megawatt hours so for, for this year. Uh, and for planning purposes for the future, they're assuming a growth rate of 0.8%. And that'll be a little different than what we're going to see in the rate study, but that's what they do for planning purposes. So, uh, This next slide gives you an idea of what the monthly energy requirements are for the village's electric system. Uh, and you can see that they range you know, typically from a low of, of, of a couple thousand megawatt hours to a high almost of nearly 4,000 in the summertime. Uh, your electric system is clearly a summer peaking system. Uh, which is evidenced by the fact that you're predominantly residential, uh, as you'll see when we get into the rate study presentation. So, I might add it's not only that it's, uh, that it's summer peak and it's also driven by temperature. Uh, this slide gives you historically what the, what the peak loads have been over the last four years, and you can see that the last two years have actually been down a little bit, and that's because our highest temperature during the summer months have been a little lower than we saw back in 2011-2012. You can see in 2012, when you had a 102 uh, temperature, high, high temperature in the summer, you hit uh, about 8.5 megawatts, uh, and only you know, down in the 7.5 megawatt range uh, for the last couple summers. So. You got different months and days. How is that determined? I'm sorry? The peak, peak temperature is then September for the last two years, and July for the... It's when our hottest day was. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it, that's the hottest day. Those were, typically, it's going to be on the hottest day. Not necessarily always is, but it's typically going to be around the hottest day of the summer. But those right. dates are when we had our peak usage. They weren't based. It was based on the temp, on the usage, not on. That's the That's right. Yeah, it's right. yeah. The, the KW, the megawatt demand up at the top. The, these numbers here are basically right off of your meter. You know, there's a meter out there at, at the interconnect with Dayton Power and Light that meters both energy as well as demand, and it keeps track of that demand, just like the village has on large power customers, for example, uh, where you meter peak demand and. Um, you know, basically use that for uh, for purposes of uh, setting rates. So, what's HE estimate? Uh, our ending, e Eastern Standard Time. Yeah, yeah I guess I should no, put so, that on the first so slide. Three o'clock in the afternoon, or four o'clock in the afternoon. Last that's night. correct, and that's typically when when your peak is going to occur is in yeah. sometime in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, and unless I, for some reason we'd have a little hot hotter temperature a little later in the day mm -hmm. uh, on that on that hottest day, but usually it's going to be sometime in the 3 or 4 o'clock range. Mm -hmm. And I'd be willing to bet <laughs> that the September 5th last year was Labor Day weekend. Or, yeah, Labor Day weekend. Um, may have been. I'll be honest, I don't know off the top of my head. More people yeah. coming in and out of the yeah. house. and Maybe. Yeah, but usually businesses aren't open, and that well, lowers your too. peak. So usually it doesn't occur on a weekend if I'm... Thinking. Not normally, but in your case, because you're so heavy residential, it could uh, for your system peak, but that may not be the peak that, you, that is set for the system, which is which drives some of your costs, as we're going to talk about in a little bit. So, um, this just gives you going back even further, and you can see historically you've actually had an even bigger load if you go back several years ago. Uh, you know, you were almost at the uh, 12 or you know, 11 and a half megawatt range. Uh, obviously, you can see the effects of when Antioch closed and, and your load is starting to kind of build back from that. So, uh, and if you follow the, 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 you know, the temperature graph on the bottom, you'll kind of correlate that with some of the, the jumps in the demand. So, uh, And by the way, as noted down here in the far right-hand corner, AMP's also projecting uh, a, a growth rate of eight-tenths of a percent on your demand, uh, same as they are on your energy, so, um, which is pretty typical unless we'd have some reason to, to think otherwise. So. What yeah. is the significance of the U.S. GDP? Uh, AMP actually tries to correlate your load to that as well, although I think in, in your particular case, because, again, you're predominantly residential and, you're, and, and your peaks are going to be driven more by temperature, uh, I, I don't think that really factors in as much into their model, um, you know, as, as what uh, the temperature does. So. Now, PJM, as I said, that's the uh, regional transmission organization that basically Dayton Power and Light is a part of. Uh, by the way, PJM does stand for Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland. Uh, PJM's operated up on, on the East Coast for a long, long time, uh, only been in the last decade or so that it's basically uh, been operating here in the Midwest. 
Uh, and all of the investor-owned electric utilities in the state of Ohio are all a part of PJM now. We, we were kind of segregated for a few years, uh, but now all of them, including uh, um, you know, Duke or you know, Cincinnati Gas Electric, as I still <laughs> think of it, uh, but all of those utilities within the state of Ohio are now uh, a part of PJM, which actually makes things a little better for, uh, for operation of the grid. So, uh, As it says there, they operate the high voltage transmission grid and they dispatch the generation to meet reliability in the most economical manner. Some might argue it's not economical sometimes, but at least that's their, that's their charge. Uh, and they have what they call an in, uh, installed capacity requirement. Uh, because they're responsible for make, maintaining reliability on the system, they have to make sure there's enough generation available to meet the peaks on the grid. Uh, and so they do that, first off, by uh, applying a reserve margin that basically allows for you know, unplanned outages on the system. So they allow, uh, they, they take the historical loads or the projected loads and add 15% as a reserve margin. Uh, and as it says there, PGM doesn't own any generation, just like they don't own transmission. Uh, what they do is they acquire the right to call on generation uh, through what they call the reliability pricing model or RPM model. Uh, and that's done through a mark, uh, an auction basically uh, to acquire that capacity from those who own generation and in fact, as you're going to learn, some of the resources that you have are bid into those auctions and you actually get credit or get a payment, uh, in essence, for the value of, the, of that capacity. Uh, AMP kind of manages that for you. But, uh, so if you're a generator owner, you basically can get compensated for making your generation available to PJM to call on uh, if need be during, uh, during peak periods. So. Uh, and, and basically, the auction uh, takes place every year, but it's uh, for three years in advance. Um, and now we were supposed to have one scheduled for May of this year for the 2018-19 planning year. PGM is <laughs> planning some changes to their, uh, to kind of the rules of the game, so to speak. Uh, and so they've got a case pending at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, and they've asked to delay the auction for this May. Uh, probably it'll be more likely to happen in August. But, but basically every three years you have these auctions where they where owners of generation bid into the auction process. And PGM has designated what they think the need is going to be, what the requirement is for capacity. Uh, and they start stacking the bids from the lowest cost up towards the highest cost. And when they get to the point where they've gotten the amount of capacity they're trying to acquire, in their case usually about 160,000 megawatts, that's the price that's set for everybody below that that bid in. They basically are then all what they call cleared in the auction, uh, and they get that price of that unit that's the last unit in. Uh, it's what we call the marginal cost. Um, and actually, every, every supplier of generation who bid below that gets that price. Um, seems a little backwards, but, but <laughs> if you're a generator, you really like this program. If you're a buyer <laughs> of, of capacity, which uh, in essence, everybody is. Uh, it it's, it's obviously doesn't play to your advantage. But, uh, but for that generation that you own, again, you get compensated at that clearing price, that last unit, highest priced unit that uh, was required to cover the load during the auction. Now, there are some, some incremental auctions that follow that up until the time when the, when the year starts. Uh, I forgot to mention, too, by the way, the planning year runs from June 1st through the end of May. So it's not a calendar year. It's a, it's a planning year that That's starts year. at the beginning of the summer. Um, and so, um, so again, you know, you're, you'll get compensated, but, but AMP always makes sure that they bid in low enough for their resources to, to hopefully get compensated uh, so that they clear. If, they, if you don't clear, then you don't get paid for your generation. Uh, you basically get, you, you'll not get anything for it. So, and there are obviously generator owners who don't, who, who bid too high <laughs> and, uh, and don't get cleared, so. Uh, as the last bullet there says, the village pays RPM capacity charges based on its peak load contribution, or what we call PLC. And the way that's determined is uh, PJM looks at your load at the time of PJM's five highest peaks on their system, or what we call the five coincident peaks, five CPs. And whatever your load is during those five peaks, and they occur different days during the usually during the summer, they take your five numbers, they add them up, divide them by five, and that becomes your peak load contribution. And that's what you're going to pay for capacity, for use of the transmission grid. And you're going to get paid or get a credit for any capacity that you bid in, kind of offsets that. So uh, you don't own or have, have control, I should say, over enough generation to cover your load, as you'll see a little bit later. But 
but at least it does help defer or, or offset some of those uh, RPM costs for you, those capacity costs. So. Uh, and this gives you an idea of what those prices have looked like, the clearing prices over the last several years and, and, and the auctions that took place. Uh, you can see for this year coming up, the 1516, the price is about $4.09, and that's a kilowatt month. Uh, that's not, uh, that would relate to about um, eight tenths of a cent per kilowatt hour, or, or eight mils per, per, uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. So, um, and you can see that that number is going to drop. You know, down to about $1.80 per kilowatt month uh, for the next planning year. Again, we know these numbers. They're already bid. The auctions are pretty much done. We've got some incremental auctions, but they don't change much. And then 17, 18, they're going to jump back up to 365. Now, this green line, the black line, by the way, applies to you because you're part of the, uh, the Western PJM system. You can see DPNL listed here. And that's the, the price we pay. You pay. That's the price you'll pay for capacity. And that's what we get. Paid and you get paid before. that price. It's, it's not quite a wash because right. your generation, for example, if you own a, um, you know, well, let me just pick on the wind, I guess. Uh, you know, the wind resource that you have, the Blue Creek wind, mm -hmm. uh, I think you've got, I think it's 700 kilowatts if I remember right. Um, but that resource doesn't get paid for 700 kilowatts when it bids in because PGM knows that that's not always going to be 100% available during the peaks, during the summertime. Mm -hmm. And so they discount that. And typically, it's going to be somewhere around its capacity factor, probably about 30, 35 percent of, of its rated capacity. On the other hand, if you've got a plant that you know can run all the time, the Fremont Energy Center that we're going to talk about a little later that you own part of, because it, they know it's going to be available to run, uh, it, it's gas fired and it's going to have gas available in the summer, uh, it gets 100 percent of its capacity paid for. So, um, you know, solar, for example, typically is going to get discounted to about 15 percent. Uh, because that's roughly what the capacity factor is. So it doesn't get full credit. What about our uh, hydroelectric that's coming? Your hydroelectrics are, again, pretty close to their capacity factor, that's about 60%. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, now, you're, uh, yeah, you're not in JV5, but it, so it wouldn't apply. But no, you, it's typically going to be around there. Now, a, after a while, after the generators, the, the hydros get built and get running, they might look at historical data and, and might give you a little higher number or a lower number, depending on what historical uh, right. operations have been. If there was a real drought or something, I suppose that could affect. That's right. Yeah, because they are right of the river, as, yeah. as you'll see a little bit later. So, mm -hmm. uh, This green line, by the way, not to scare you to death with it. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of other clients, unfortunately, they're going to be seeing those kind of numbers. Uh, that's on the First Energy system. Uh, several years ago, First <coughs> Energy, First Energy basically owns Toledo Edison, Ohio Edison, and Cleveland Electric Illuminating up in the northern part of the state. Um, and uh, several years ago, uh, First Energy announced that they were going to retire several coal-fired plants. And as a result, there was a concern about capacity shortage along the, along the lake, along Lake Erie. And so PJM decided to pull First Energy out and do a separate auction for them, separate from the rest of PJM. Hmm. Uh, and the result, you can see what happened. Uh, we saw this huge spike out here in the 1516. Keep in mind, that auction, 1516, was run back in 2012. And so it was right after that announcement in 2000, you know, before that, uh, and it caused a spike in the price. So these numbers are not driven by cost. These numbers are driven more by generators, owners' perception of where they think the, the auction is going to fall. Okay. So. And maybe there's no good answer to this, but why do they do it so far in advance? Uh, well, actually, some would say they ought to be doing it even further out in longer term so you have a better idea of what the cost is going to be. Um, I mean, one of the problems we have is it makes this make this short. We consider this to be a short time frame. Uh, it makes it difficult to plan your future resources when you don't know what the value of those resources are going to be okay. 10, 20 years out. Keep in mind, when you you build a new resource, it's going to last hopefully 30, 40, 50 right. years, uh, and you only know three years ahead of time, you know what what that market's going to look like, uh, and and it probably is going to take you longer than that to get the plant built. So by the time you get the plant built, you only you know. These right. numbers will be yeah. totally different. So. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's a pretty big fluctuation from 84 cents in 2013 to the 894. Yeah, and, and again, that, that was kind of a little bit of a fluke because of what was announced. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and everybody's got their own crystal ball as to where these numbers are going to go in the future. Uh, I mean, arguably, if we're going to be closing down a number of generating resources uh, in, in, this, you know, in the PJM system, um, then we're going to have less bidders, uh, and so likelihood is the price is going to go up. Uh, unlikely that it's going to go down. So, 
Uh, this just gives you an idea of what the impact of those charges are on your total electric costs for, you know, your power supply cost. Um, and again, AMP puts this together, so, um, but basically what, what they're showing here is the, the clear or the white, we'll call them the white columns, are the total impact of that cost on your, on your energy cost. So, so for example, for this year, if we go back, that uh, $3.83 is causing an impact on you of about $12 per megawatt hour. That's 1.2 cents a kilowatt hour, okay, if you, mm -hmm. if you relate it to mm -hmm. price per kilowatt hour. But because you have generation capacity, uh, the net impact of that, because you're getting paid for your generation, is about $9. So it reduces it a little bit for the 14-15 planning year. Now for 15-16, you can see that, again, that, that total impact is about $14, but because of generation capacity you have, it drops, the impact, net, net impact is $2. And that's because of the hydros, which were planned to come on by April of this year, and they're not. And you'll see a slide later, it's going to say it's going to be later in the year. Unfortunately, so you're, you know, uh, so that could change you're not going to, yes, well, it's going to, it's going to change because you're not going to get full, full benefit. Mm -hmm. um, the, the numbers for 16, 17 also, again, reflect the hydros being up and running, which they hopefully will all be up and running by, by the time we hit May of, or June of 2016. The 17, 18, you know, you think, well, why, why do all of a sudden we see this, this orange line go up? Why does the net go up, um, you know, so much? And more so than obviously what the, the overall capacity cost does. And that's because JV2 units, which you're going to learn about, peaking units that you own, or that you actually do own, that's a joint venture, are planned to be retired uh, in 17. So um, that being the case, you lose the benefit of that capacity, um, you know, in your, uh, which in peaking, your power costs. Which, pe which, which, which things are the peaking elements that we own? Oh, I've got a slide that okay. will give you kind of some detail on it. So. All right. uh, um, you can't handle the suspense. Yes. <laughs> we're, we're just talking about capacity <laughs> charges here. Is there, um, could you give us some perspective on what percentage uh, of our total energy costs, you know, for the, the village capacity charges represent when you add in energy charges as well in, in terms of, you know, what, what we're looking at? Because there's a lot of, this, a lot of variability here. I don't know how important that is. Well, uh, going forward, uh, from where when these hydro historically capacity cost has not been as big a percentage of your power supply cost is what it will be going forward when the hydros come on, uh, and, and we have some slides later that'll that'll kind of point this out for you. But when these hydro units come on and you start being charged for them, they carry with them uh, a significant amount of debt and a significant amount of, of fixed costs or what we would call demand related costs, uh, not energy related because it doesn't vary. Regardless of how much energy comes out of the plant, you still pay that debt service payment. Uh, and you're going to see that uh, when you start seeing these bills from the hydro, and you're going to see it in your power supply costs. You're probably going to go from less than half your power supply costs being demand related to well over half your costs being demand related. Uh, the energy cost isn't really going to change much, but when you're going to see how much your power cost is going to increase, you can attribute almost all of that to demand related costs. I've got some slides in the cost of service study that'll show this a little more directly for you, if you, you know, but uh, it gives you a rough idea anyway, so. Uh, well, with that, um, kind of backdrop on how the, how the grid works, let's talk a little bit about your power supply arrangements and your resources. Um, your power, as I said before, you're a part of what's called the WASG pool with AMP, uh, you know, a group of the community of municipal electric systems all connected to Dayton Power and Light. Uh, and you have what we call a portfolio of resources, and we're going to walk you through each of those so you kind of know what you've got and, and how they work. Um, and so in this pool, you have what's called non-pool resources and pool resources or pool power. Your non-pool resources, your non-pool power are the things that you basically decided you, you, that you wanted to be a part of, that you made that decision and selected those yourself. And so that's going to be things like the hydros uh, that we talked about, uh, things like the Fremont Energy Center, um, you know, the Blue Creek, uh, you know, wind, uh, you know, the, the landfill gas, you know, those types of projects. Everything above those resources is, comes from the pool, what we call pool power. Uh, I'll have some slides back here that will show you kind of how that works. But what AMP does is they monitor the load, the meter, actual metering points of all of the members of the pool, uh, and they schedule the resources to meet the load requirements. Now, it's a little bit of a misnomer in that um, actually so, some of the resources actually get dispatched, like Fremont. 
Uh, Fremont's actually dispatched by PJM based on, a mar on the market, based on economics. But your hydros basically are, are, are going to, you know, run of, when they come on, will be run of the river. Um, your NIPA power is basically a scheduled resource. It doesn't uh, get driven by economics. Uh, and uh, the wind and, and the uh, landfill, you basically get what you get. Uh, so, but the AMP does at least monitor those compared to the load of the group uh, and then tries to go out and make purchases ahead, whether it be day ahead or weeks ahead or months ahead, to try to hedge, you know, price volatility in the marketplace. So, um, and AMP operates a number of pools this way. They've been doing these pools, geez, I think the first ones we did were like back in 89. So uh, they've got a lot of experience with, with operating and managing these, these power pools. So um, this slide gives you a breakdown of your resources. And I, I went with the 2017 only because uh, that's the year that you basically have all of these resources available to you. As I said, JV2 sometime in 2017 will probably get, <coughs> well, could get retired. That'll all depend on more on environmental issues at this point, but at least uh, for planning purposes, that's what AMP is anticipating, uh, is that we will not have JV2 after the peaks of 17. Um, you've got, you're kind of going down the list, you've got 300 kilowatts of the Blue Creek wind, I think I said 700, I had them backwards with the landfill. Um, you've got 30, 333 kilowatts, uh, by the way, uh, I've got a slide and we'll go through more detail of each of these for you. Uh, 333 kilowatts from NIPA, that's the New York Power Authority hydro plants that are up uh, uh, off, off the Niagara Falls and St. Lawrence River. Um, 580 kilowatts of what's called uh, AFEC or the AMP Fremont Energy Center. That's a gas-fired plant up, in, up by Fremont, Ohio. 700 kilowatts of landfill gas. Um, and that's, that's a nice resource. It runs all the time, pretty much. Uh, you get it uh, pretty much around the clock. Uh, 799 kilowatts that you will be getting uh, once it's up and running from the AMP Hydro One projects. Uh, and there's three separate hydro projects involved there. Uh, we talked about the Omega JV2, 1,408 kilowatts participation in that project, and that is actually ownership, uh, unlike the other ones which are more power purchase agreements where, you know, AMP has gone out and contracted for, for example, for Blue Creek and Landfill Gas, uh, or Fremont, which it owns, um, <clears throat> but JV5, or JV2, excuse me, you actually own jointly with other communities um, in Ohio. And what kind of power, how does that produce electricity? That's natural gas-fired peaking unit. It's actually a combined cycle. I'll, I'll get some slides that will get into some detail on that for you. Um, and then the last one there is the 2,717 kilowatts of what we call AMP Hydro 2, um, and uh, which obviously that combined with AMP Hydro 1, which are still not online, uh, certainly will be by 17, I would hope, but uh, should be before uh, uh, 16 or in 16, uh, is basically your current portfolio of, uh, of existing resources. Now, as I said before, uh, all the pool resources then uh, are, are basically selected by AMP and the pool members. And those are typically short-term purchases. I, I, I mentioned hourly or weekly or daily uh, or daily or weekly. They also do up to one year. Uh, and AMP actually has authority under your pool contract to make one year per, up to one year purchases without approval of the pool, but they never do it. Uh, in fact, we've got a pool meeting coming up next week where AMP is going to be making some recommendations on buying replacement energy for the hydro projects because they didn't come on in April and so they're going to have some recommendations on the pool buying power to make up for that shortfall that everybody will have from the uh, hydros uh, being deferred so, or being delayed. So, uh, and Like I said, I've got some slides here again. I put these, <laughs> I think this is the one I, I forgot to uh, pull their logo off of so we'll give them some credit. Uh, these slides basically are prepared by AMP. So um, the Blue Creek Wind Project basically is located see on the location map over in Van Wert County. Uh, it's, uh, if you've ever been by there, I mean, it's, you see winter as about as far as you can see. Uh, the, the power for your particular, uh, uh, or AMP's purchase, I should say, on your behalf, is from 152 turbines. Uh, they're owned by a company called Iberdrola, actually a Spanish company. Uh, and that contract will run through December of 2022. Um, it's, uh, Got an expected load or capacity factor uh, of 32%, uh, and it basically is is like run of the river. It's run of the wind. You get your percentage share of whatever is produced uh, each hour, and if it produces zero, you get zero. If it's running at full output, you get your full share of whatever that output is, that full output. So no replacement. They don't. They don't make up the difference. No one. No one makes up the difference for it. That's correct. 
Uh, the members that are participants receive 50% of the renewable energy credits for that project uh, for the years 2013 through 2016, those were the first four years, and after that they get 100%. Uh, so you basically are receiving or generating renewable energy credits associated with this project. Now I know the question is going to get asked, uh, so I already called AMP to confirm, uh, and you are not selling your Blue Creek Wind Rex for 2014 and two, or 2015 and 14. They, they kind of sell them after the fact. Uh, and AMP, by the way, even though I, I know if you read the contract the way it reads, it says that AMP can sell those on your behalf and monetize them. It's the, late, the word they use, and you can get cash for them. But AMP doesn't do that without your permission. Every community is given the opportunity to say, yes, I want to sell my RECs, or no, I don't want to sell my RECs. Uh, and that's an individual decision that you make here, just like Tip City would make or you know, Eldorado would make. It, do it, it do they typically to come to just Johnny and the, the village manager, or do they? Oh, uh, we probably come to the village manager. How, how far in advance do they do that? Uh, usually, they, they normally do. I try to do a couple years at a time, uh, but it, it just depends on where the market's at. AMP has people on staff who track the market for renewable energy credits all the time, uh, and so and they have. They're a part of what's called uh, the Energy Authority, TEA, which is basically uh, 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 energy supply advisor, so to speak, down in Florida, in Jacksonville, uh, that's created by Municipal Electric Systems and, and, and power supply agencies like AMP. Mm -hmm. uh, and AMP's a part of that, and they have people on their staff that monitor this stuff all the time. So if they see uh, a trend starting to develop in RECs, uh, you know, they may contact AMP and say, hey, you might want to look at selling some, or, you know, uh, this may be a good opportunity to do that. So they don't just, it's not just willy-nilly. I mean, they actually monitor what's going on and try to get maximize the, the, uh, uh, you know, the value for it. So somewhere previously, the decision was made to not sell 14 and 15, but 16 is still out there, so they may, they'll come this year to ask about. Yes, okay. and they may, they may actually come after the fact. Actually, reps are kind of, kind of interesting the way they work. Um, you can actually sell them after you've got them. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it's fairly common to sell them after you've got them because if you sell them before you've got them from a resource like this, you don't know for sure what you're going to have. And if you sell something you don't have, then you've got to go find it to make it available to the person who's paying you for them. So, and you may find them at a higher price than what you're getting. So, so usually if you're going to sell them, you sell them ahead. You sell them less than what you think you're going to have. Uh, and then what happens is after the fact, if you had more, then you've got some available to sell backwards. And you can sell them backwards to people who need them for, mm -hmm. to, for credit for 2015. I mean, 16 is you could sell 15s and 16 for, for people who needed them in 15 after the fact. Yeah. So can we, what would stop us from selling 14 and 15? Pardon? Why can't we sell 14 and 15? You chose not to. You were given that option and the village uh, elected not to sell. Can we change that decision? Um, you might not be able to sell, you know, you might still be able to sell 14s. Uh, certainly 15s, I think you can. Well, and who made that decision? Someone prior to you me. You weren't here. I wasn't here. So. Could, could you tell the, the council what selling the, the RECs mean as far as the, uh, the village is concerned? Well, from a technical point of view, if you if you don't retain RECs, then technically that, re, that renewable resource, at least from the standpoint of like e-green certification and whatnot is not considered renewable anymore because you sold that renewable tag, that, that credit, to someone else who is claiming that that's a renewable resource for them. So, so yeah, it's not, uh, I mean, it, 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 if you're feeling that you want to keep them because you want to be able to claim that those are clearly renewable kilowatt hours that you got, then you wouldn't want to sell them. Yeah, but I, I mean, if we're looking, if we're looking at what we're actually using and if we're using renewable energy and we have the opportunity to sell the credit and so we so we can't be e-green or whatever but we can make money on it at least at least we need to have a conversation about that right absolutely yeah, and, I, and I, I will tell you this you don't have a renewable energy portfolio requirement okay uh in ohio and i'm sure many of you are aware that there is a requirement for the investor on electric utilities in Ohio that they have to have meet certain thresholds for renewable energy and, and alternative energy sources. Um, and in order to do that, they would either have to, you know, have a resource that is considered renewable or buy RECs to make that up. 
municipal electric systems are not a part of that requirement, so you do not have a requirement to have any amount of your energy as renewable. It's a local decision that you, you decide. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't have an obligation to retain those uh, and could sell those and monetize them. I say a lot of my clients do, and there are several like yourself that don't. Uh, it's just a, a local choice as to what they want to do with them. Well, I'd like to suggest that we look into seeing whether we can and that we involve the Energy Board in the consideration and as we're looking at developing a climate action plan, we think about whatever impacts that has. There, there is another option, too, is that Oberlin uses a, uh, a rec broker mm -hmm. and resells the rec to the broker. They get the money and they get to say that they're using they don't get as much money, but they do. That's the method they got to went, went to get around this. But they they buy generic recs back. Right? Actually, they buy back. Right, right. They yeah. buy back cheap. So, yeah. They trade, right. they trade yeah. their high price, right. their high value recs for low yeah. value recs. And then, yeah, and they buy generic back so they can still claim so to be exactly. green. But if but. we sell all our recs, we cannot claim. <laughs> but we know we're green. But we know we're investing in. Right. Green sure. energy, which, which which is it, it all depends on whether you want to try to apply for any government, you know, subsidy grants, things like that that mm -hmm. are aimed towards this direction. There are lots of lots of money out there, but you can't say that you're green and then be selling green. Okay. Okay. Good point. Um, I, I've lost track of where I was on the slide. Oh, the currently, uh, they're, they're trading for around $12 a megawatt hour. One rec, by the way, is, is basically a megawatt hour, a thousand kilowatt hours. So uh, for the Blue Creek wing recs, they were trading at about $12 when I uh, last checked with AMP. Um, and uh, you do receive installed capacity credits. Um, uh, <coughs> here on the slide, it's 13 to 15% credit for PJM, so it's a little less than what I, what I was telling you earlier. Um, but uh, again, that will vary based on historical data. So the, the more historical data they have, uh, the PJM will adjust those numbers. So, but again, you don't get you know, full credit for every kilowatt of capacity that you are participating in a wind project. You don't get paid that full capacity value from PJM. It gets discounted. Uh, next resource was the uh, NIPA power, the New York Power Authority. Again, uh, the power comes from the, uh, the two federal uh, uh, pro hydro projects uh, uh, on the Niagara uh, project and the St. Lawrence project. It does not come from any of the non-renewable resources of NIPA, by the way. I know that question came up once before uh, uh, when I mentioned that you get power from NIPA and it's renewable because NIPA is a, a pretty big organization. They do operate some non-renewable resources, uh, but none of the energy that you get comes from that. In fact, you specifically get power from these hydro resources because they were funded with government money, federal government money, and the money in the so the kilowatt hours get spread across to public entities across a, a number of states, but most of which abut the Great Lakes, and that's because that's where the water comes from that goes through the dams, you know, through that hydro plant. So, uh, so you give what we used to call your God-given right to uh, to some of that power. Uh, you can see there that it's the amount you get is based on the total number of residential meters that you had in 2002. So that number's not been updated for some time, um, but it could get reallocated in the future. Um, and they go through that every so often, they'll go through a new allocation. Um, Are there recs associated with, with uh, NIPA? Uh, no, you do not get recs with NIPA. It was prior to all the green, e green tags being created. Um, if you were a part of AMP's, um, what we call Omega JV5 hydro project, you would for that project. It was probably one of the first large hydro projects in the Midwest that, that, was, that did qualify for, for RECs. Um, the, um, uh, the new hydro projects will be certified for RECs, so you will get RECs associated with the AMP Hydro 1 and AMP Hydro 2 projects so okay. for your proportionate share. Um, and it says there you do even get some interruptible power, but what, what I think is really kind of key on this, this slide, though, it's interesting with the power that comes from NIPA. You're probably wondering how you get power at a negative cost, but that actually does happen. Uh, the way the transmission grid works, when, uh, when you have a resource, for example, that's distant away from you, like this is, um, you get paid for putting that power into the grid at what's called the locational marginal price of energy, 
uh, at that location. And then you pay to take energy out over here, you know, on the Dayton Power and Light System. Um, and it turns out, because power traditionally runs west to east on the grid, you're actually reversing the flow. And so you're actually making money, you're actually getting paid to take this night of power uh, to the tune of about a minus three cents a kilowatt hour, a credit of three cents a kilowatt hour. Not a bad arrangement to have. It's fortunate to be on this side of the dam, <laughs> so to speak, upstream, uh, as opposed to downstream, where obviously it's, it, it works the other way, going the other direction. So, so yeah, that's not that's not a misprint. Uh, there are months, in fact, where it's what we call. If you see, if you look at like the fourth, third line down, it says net congestion losses. Uh, that's basically what happens. It's what we call congestion, and you're actually relieving congestion on the transmission system by moving this power from Niagara Falls to Ohio and you actually get paid for that more than what it costs to buy that power. It, uh, I think it might also be important to note that this project is so old that it's paid off. Yeah, absolutely. So that has a huge impact on it as well. But yeah. As I, as I tell my clients, this, this, is the, this is the cheapest resource you got. Uh, and while it doesn't get green tags, it is renewable. Uh, the, the sad part is you can't get any more of what they tell you you're allowed to get. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you'd love to get a lot more of it, but unfortunately you're limited to what you know what your allocation is based on how big you are. So uh, next resource is that Fremont Energy Center that was asked uh, about down uh, earlier. Uh, again, this is a natural gas combined cycle unit. Uh, it's basically uh, when we say combined cycle, it means it's got gas turbines that are fired initially. It's what we call the intermediate capacity. And then it has what's called duct firing capability where it can, it has a steam boiler on the back and it can add more gas and create more energy. Uh, and you can see it's about 512 megawatts of intermediate capacity, about 163 of the, of the peaking. Um, came online back in January 2012. Uh, and it has been running a fair amount. In fact, it was anticipated to run at about 40 to 50 percent capacity factor. And there are several months where it's been running in excess of 50. Uh, it's all driven by, as I said earlier, it's all driven by the economics of the market. So when this, when this plant can generate kilowatt hours cheaper than the market it's going to run and sell into the market, uh, if, if its cost of, of operation, or, you know, the, the price to, to generate the electricity out of it is higher than the market, then it won't run. Uh, and uh, so it does, it'll get cycled up usually during the on-peak periods and back down, uh, you know, at night. And that's the way it's designed to operate. So. Uh, but it is natural gas fired. Um, it does get capacity credits. Um, and in fact, it gets full capacity credits because it's pretty pretty much in anticipated that it'll be available on demand. So, uh, next one is the EDI landfill gas project, um, and you can see that this basically consists of uh, almost 54 megawatts of capacity. Uh, located at three different landfills around the northern part of the state, the one in Ottawa County, one in Lorraine County, and one over in uh, Mahoning County, uh, the carbon limestone landfill. Um, EDI operates a number of these types of facilities, by the way, throughout the country. Uh, so this is something that they, uh, you know, they're pretty good at. Uh, you get this at 100% load factor. does include replacement uh, arrangement, but it, they don't have to do a lot of uh, replacement. It runs pretty much flat out all the time. And if you're not familiar with landfill gas, by the way, uh, you know, landfills, when they're capped, uh, you know, the, the, the degradation of what's in the landfill turns into methane gas. And that methane gas has to be something done with it, uh, or it'll just build up pressure over time and create problems getting, getting groundwater and, and other problems. So typically what we've done in the past is burned it off, or flare, what we call flare. Uh, so that you go by a landfill and you see a big, you know, uh, flume of uh, fire a lot of times at the flare. Uh, well, over the years, they figured out a way to capture that gas, clean it up, because it is fairly dirty, uh, but they clean it up and they put it through, normally, uh, you know, look like a diesel engine generator set, uh, and uh, basically generate electricity. Now, there's still a little bit of emission from it, but it is still considered to be a renewable resource uh, and does, uh, does generate wrecks. Uh, this one, the wrecks ran out in 2013, I believe. Um, and uh, so you're no longer getting wrecks associated with this one. So, yeah. Well, it wouldn't be an endless supply. It, 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 it's, one it's not necessarily endless, but if you, if you size it right, they tell me that if you size it correctly and don't oversize it, uh, it can become somewhat perpetual. Uh, because you if you size the, the generator to match what's being gen what gas is being created every year, 
so that you don't over use the gas. But but you're right. They have usually have a limited life. Uh, AMP is in the second 10-year contract though for these for these and so uh, it, it, yeah. It's just a matter of how you how you match the size of the of the generators to the available gas that's coming from landfill. As I understand as well, I'm no gan landfill gas expert by any means. I got a couple of clients that we we assisted them in negotiating individual contracts um, where they thought they were going to have them put in and they never came to fruition. So I learned a lot about it, but I don't claim to be an expert. But uh, but what I've been told is if you size it small enough, uh, it, where you don't consume more than what's being created every year, it can be somewhat perpetual. I mean, you might get, you know, 30 years or more out of it, so. And are there more? Are these the only ones in the state, or are there? No, no, there are others throughout the state. These are the ones that AMP has a contract with, uh, with EDI, so. Now, whether this will get renewed or not at the end of this 10-year term, uh, this runs through 2021, I don't know. Uh, again, this is in the second 10-year term of, of a contract that uh, AMP had initially, so. Uh, now we're into the AMP Hydro projects. Uh, AMP Hydro 1 uh, basically consists of, of three different hydro uh, projects at existing lock and dams on the Ohio River. Uh, the Smithland, the Candleton, and the Willow Island uh, projects. Uh, and by the way, you see that notation there behind Smithland and Candleton, it says MISO, M-I-S-O. That's the Midwest ISO. That's the kind of the counterpart to PJM in the Midwest. Uh, and so those plants are not directly connected to the grid, you know, to the PJM interconnect. Not a big deal, uh, just means that uh, you have to kind of, you know, you bid into MISO's auction. You can actually bid them into PJM, but then you've got to pay a, a price to get it moved across uh, from MISO to PJM. So, um, but none of these units are up and running yet. Uh, they were anticipated at least uh, the Smithland and Candleton to start in April of this year. <coughs> now we're being told it's more likely going to be around September. Um, you know, there were some delays that weren't anticipated. So, uh, and the Willow Island is, is really was planned to start in June, and again, uh, we're not going to see that in June as well. It's probably going to be later in the year. Uh, combined, I think somebody asked about capacity factors earlier. Combined load factor or capacity factor? I got to blame Ann for that. It's really capacity factor. <laughs> it's her slide. Uh, it's 56 percent. So. Uh, yeah, John, it, the Smithland is running really far behind. I know, <coughs> and this says uh, starting April of 2016. Is that correct? Or no, right? it says uh, oh Smithland. Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably. I mean, that's that that may be close on Smithland. It okay. may be a little later than that. Uh, but the other two but are the other two be are later. clearly not going to be until later this year. Yeah, they're not mm -hmm. going to. Well, um, they weren't. You know, Council didn't start in April. Here we are. 27th, and it's not going to be running, so mm -hmm. unfortunately. And as I said before, and we'll talk a little bit about it, they, they're basically looking to buy replacement energy to make up that shortfall for you. So, um, we talked a little bit about the JV2 peaking years before. Um, basically, consists of uh, 35 what we what I call cats in a box uh, diesel units. They're 1,800 kilowatt units, uh, and you can see those in that middle picture. I know it's kind of small. Uh, you can see a grouping here of uh, three of those units. Uh, they're basically in a semi-trailer box. Uh, they come all pre-set up and everything, and you just set them down uh, and uh, more or less hook them up to a fuel source, hook them up to the electric system, and uh, start generating. Uh, there are also two 32 <coughs> megawatt uh, gas turbines. These are not combined cycles; they're just single cycle cycle gas turbines, uh, and one 11 megawatt gas turbine. Um, and these are we we say distributive generation units. They're located in various communities that are that are members of the project or participants in the project. So, uh, some of some of them are down in Hamilton, some in Bowling Green. Uh, I think the 11 megawatts is in um, St. Mary's, um, and then 35 diesel units are really scattered all over the place, uh, usually in groups of three. Um, so, you know, they could they could locate it in various places. Um, as I said there too, the JV units are to be retired sometime probably in 2017. And that's primarily because of environmental issues. Now, they, they are doing some work on those units to make them comply with what we call the rice NESHAP rules, if you're familiar with those at all, uh, reciprocating engine uh, uh, emission requirements, so that they can continue to bid them in and get paid for capacity. Uh, by the way, these units, you are kind of, you hope you never have to run them. Uh, they're there basically for capacity purposes, uh, because if they're running, that means the market price of energy is pretty high. So. So ideally, you hope they never run, other than for routine testing and that type of thing. So. Now, 
now this one it says this is a non pool resource that we selected yes um, is is there any way to get out of that agreement well I was asked that question here the last time I was here I think in January and, yeah, this uh, particular agreement. I don't. Rem I actually had. I don't it's remember what about this one. It's pretty old. It's a pretty old. Yeah, I mean, I think it was before my time. No, I'll take and that we're back. an owner. Yeah, I'll, I'll take it back. I think I was asked about the Fremont. Yeah, that's yeah. the one yeah. we've asked Fremont. about. Yeah. This one. I, I, to be honest, I don't see a reason to probably <clears throat> uh, try to get out of it because I think in a couple of years it's not even going to exist. Uh, I think yeah. we're going to see these units probably retired. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, but it sounds like that's a little up in the air and. Ohio doesn't seem to be interested in reinforcing environmental laws and things like that right now. So I mean, maybe uh, that'll change. Well, but again, I think the, the laws that they already know are coming. They're anticipating they're not going to be able to cost justify upgrading the units. Okay. Uh, so okay. I, I think the environment, unless something really changes. Um, but again, that's, that's, you know, you could look into that if you wanted to try to uh, divest of these and, and get somebody to take them. The, these are a little bit more complicated than the Fremont. We, I, I know we mm -hmm. were asked about Fremont when I was here last. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fremont is a, what we call a power purchase agreement. Yeah. Um, now AMP owns that Fremont unit. They issued the debt for it, and you have yeah. a contract and an obligation to pay your share of costs, whatever they are, over the life of the, of the project, which is yeah. either the, the life of the, uh, of the debt or the life of the unit, whichever is longer. Um, and you can sell that um, obligate, or you can assign that to, to another you know, entity, but it has to not jeopardize the tax exempt status of the debt on the project, uh, which mm -hmm. you can't. So, I'm not saying you couldn't divest it to a private entity, but it'd be a lot easier to do it to another public entity like yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and as I recall from the contract, you don't necessarily get out of your ultimate obligation. Right. Now, as long as the part of you who takes over your obligation pays, pays their bills, then you know you don't have to pay. But if for some reason they would default. They can reach back to you, um, you know, to uh, yeah. to make up, you know, whatever yeah. you know, shortfall it would be. But, but this might be a different kind of arrangement. Well, this is totally different. This is ownership. This is actually owner oh, joint this ownership. This is ownership. Okay. You actually own a piece of this of all of these units, a proportionate share or project mm -hmm. share proportionally with all the other participants. It, get, it would be a little more difficult to get out of this project than okay. it would be uh, the the PPA with AMP because you just assign the contract over. We're here. You're actually assigning an ownership right. right. Um, but that is ending, probably, and it is. A well, it's not. Big it's not. Uh, again, I can't guarantee that it's going to be retired. But that's mm -hmm. what they're, that's what AMP is, is telling us uh, for, like. plan, for, for purposes of planning. Uh, by the way, I want I, I wanted to put it on there. I didn't. You don't have any debt associated with this project. You actually paid cash for your participation in this project. Uh, you do pay operation and maintenance costs, obviously, and you do pay for fuel when it does, if and when it does run. Uh, but you don't pay any debt service on this project, so it's not costing you just to have it sitting there. And you do receive capacity payments for it mm -hmm. uh, to the extent it bids into the market. Uh, sometimes AMP actually holds back and doesn't bid these in, and they use them for what we call peak shaving. Um, and then they'll reduce load in those communities where they're located. Uh, so, for example, let's say that there's a 32 megawatt uh, one of, the, one of those 32 megawatt gas turbines is sitting in Hamilton. And so they will they could run that unit in Hamilton and reduce their peak load contribution to the grid, you know, mm -hmm. peak load contribution, for that, <coughs> and you'll get your proportionate share of that benefit. In other words, it doesn't all go to Hamilton. Mm -hmm. It gets spread amongst the participants in the project. Uh, and so it does have some value to you. Uh, and, and in your case, obviously, more value than the debt because your debt's paid off. Okay. Let me kind of clarify that, too, when I say you paid cash. Um, you actually borrowed money from AMP to pay cash. Uh, in, instead of being a instead of being a part of the debt that was issued by the project, you actually borrowed money from AMP and, and or, you know kind of indirectly through AMP and paid cash for your share of the project, and then you paid that debt off to AMP. So it's it's been retired. So. Okay. Uh, now these next two are your, are your, basically your AMP. What we call we call AMP Hydro Two. Uh, AMP kind of likes to refer to them as the Meldal Greenup project. Uh, the Meldal project uh, is, you know, is really huge, 175 megawatt run of the river hydro. This is downstream a ways, almost down to the end of the, uh, the series of the dams on the Ohio. Um, it's, uh, now it, it was planned to start up in March and it's not started as well. And by the way, that picture is not current. It's, it's been, uh, it's underwater now, it's all 
closed in and uh, and they're getting close to startup. Um, so that picture is a little deceiving. Uh, now this has a pretty good capacity factor. Uh, they're anticipated about 60% for this unit. Um, and uh, I think a long term, this is you know probably going to be one of the one of the better long term hydro resources on the Ohio River. Uh, just because of its, you know, it's downstream, so it gets a lot of constant flow. Uh, does doesn't see quite the the sudden impacts that you see upstream from heavy rains that cause, you know, a reduction in head. The, the thing about a run of the river hydro is, you know, everybody would think that you're going to get your most output in the spring when it rains a lot. Just the opposite. You don't get as much in the spring because because it's a, a what we call low head hydro. When there's all that flow, the river starts rising, and you lose that head differential. So you, you, know, you have to have flow through the dam, but you also have to, or through the plant, but you also have to have a, a fall. You have to have water falling through it to, to create mm -hmm. energy. So, uh, so unlike you would think, you, you think in the spring, well, you're getting a lot of power, but you really get the, the bulk of the power, uh, or most more power in the summer months than you do during the spring and the fall. So. Mm -hmm. um, along with the Meldaw, and it's kind of part and parcel to the project, the city of Hamilton actually owns this Green Up project. It's been around for a long time. Um, and uh, in fact, I was working uh, with another firm back there. That was back in the mid-80s when this plant got built, I think 86. It was actually built originally by a little town called Vanceburg, Kentucky. Uh, and Hamilton was responsible for uh, like 110% of the cost, and they only got like 90% of the output. Uh, long story short, they ended up suing Vanceburg and taking over the plant. Uh, my, the firm I work for worked for Hamilton, fortunately. Um, but uh, it's a part of this project. Meldal, the Meldal license to, to develop the Meldal plant was held by the city of Hamilton. And so they negotiated with AMP an arrangement where, uh, you know, they basically gave or assigned to AMP the Meldal license to develop that project. And then AMP agrees to take over roughly half of the ownership of Greenup. Uh, and so, and, and Hamilton is going to own half of Meldal. So basically what Hamilton's doing is, is trading half of an existing plant for half of a new plant. Uh, AMP ends up with the license and, and the ability to develop the Meldal project in exchange for taking half of the green up plant. Um, but even with that, I think it's still going to turn out to be a, a pretty good combination. Uh, you can see this plant has a much lower capacity factor, about 46, uh, uh, 46%. Um, and um, you can see it's a little bit smaller too. So, um, but again, it's just it's part of the deal. If you're in both of those resources uh, for a total of a little over 2,700 uh, kilowatts. So, pretty good piece of your energy supply, as you'll see. Uh, those are all your non-pool resources. It's taking a little longer than I thought. Um, <laughs> everything over and above that, basically. Well, I shouldn't say that. You you can in addition to those resources, you can also make energy purchases in the marketplace to uh, to meet your load as non-pool resources. You're not limited. You used to have a limit, uh, but that limit went away. So you can go out and buy power in the market uh, for anywhere, typically up to about a 10-year term. Um, energy in the market does not include capacity. It's just a, it's, it's basically a commodity traded market. It's uh, um, And your counterparties, as you can see, are typically going to be utilities people like AEP, First Energy, um, or financial institutions, banks, uh, are pretty prominent in this uh, energy market. Um, one of the downsides is, though, you do have to have cash available to collateralize the purchase. It's what we call mark-to-market. So if you go out and make a contract to buy energy for, say, 10 years at uh, 4 cents a kilowatt hour, and all of a sudden the market is 3.5 cents, well, you've got to post money for that half a cent difference for the balance of the contract. Because if you default, if you don't pay, that supplier is going to have to go out and sell that at three and a half cents and take a, and take a loss. Now, it works the other way, too. If you get that 10-year that contract at four cents and the market's at four and a half cents, that supplier has to post credit, post money, uh, to, to basically cover that half a cent for the remainder of the contract so that if he defaults and doesn't deliver and you have to go buy it at four and a half, well, you've got that money to offset it to, to get you back to four cents a kilowatt hour. So it's kind of how the, how the uh, market works. Um, as with the capacity market, energy markets are basically marginal. Um, you know, when we look at what goes on on, the, on an hourly basis in the market, uh, it's again based on the cost of the last unit. So when PJM dispatches generation, uh, they look at what the 
you know, the, the, they start off with lowest cost units, uh, and as the load starts going up, they start bringing on higher cost units to meet the load. Well, the price in the market that's, that you pay for taking power off the grid is basically the cost of that highest price unit. And all those generators who, who are doing it for less than that get paid that higher price. So, again, the generators vote the rules, so <laughs> keep that in mind. That's who kind of runs the, runs the game. Um, uh, as that last bullet says, you know, the prices in the market are typically tied to natural gas prices, and that's because natural gas prices are usually the ones that are set in the market, at least during the on-peak period of the day. Uh, and this graph kind of gives you a feel for that. Uh, you can see uh, this red, the red line is basically natural gas prices, um, and the blue line is basically on-peak energy prices. On-peak being what we call a uh, 5 by 16, uh, you know, uh, 16 hours a day during the, during the five week days. Uh, now we do have a little anomaly here. Uh, when gas continued to go down, the on-peak price is basically stabled out at about a little, actually down a little bit below $40 right now, so uh, a megawatt hour, which is four cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, these energy project, uh, products that basically get traded are seven by 24. That's basically a, a Monday through Sunday, you know, all 24 hours, what we call base load or, or around the clock ATC. Uh, or we buy 5 by 16 blocks. Uh, again, those are 16 hours a day, 7 in the morning, 11 at night uh, for the five weekdays, non-holidays, I should say. And you can buy some 2 by 16s, and there, there's some variations <coughs> of it, but these are the two major products that you would typically buy. <coughs> now, as I said, the, with regard to the pool and how it operates, you know, the pool basically makes up the balance of your needs above your non-pool resources. Um, and uh, again, you know, you, you basically get to pick those pool, those non-pools, but everything else comes that comes above that is basically AMP is, is kind of balancing for you. And they're doing that <coughs> on a group basis, which is really more cost effective than you trying to do it yourself because you're a part of a much bigger group, much bigger load that's being managed. Uh, so um, this slide gives you an idea of what the, how the pool works. This was uh, February 2015. You can see these gray areas. This is what your non-pool resources were, basically every hour, uh, every day. Uh, and then the top line being your load, <coughs> the difference in yellow being basically what came from the pool. Now, you look at this graph and you say, geez, we're getting a lot of energy from the pool. And you are. Currently today, you get more than half of your energy from the pool, from the market. But when we look when those hydro units come on, that's going to change uh, considerably. In fact, this gives you an idea for what that it's kind of a little bit different graphics done on a monthly basis. So this gives you an idea of what that, uh, what that market number looks like uh, for 2017 when the hydros are up and, and finally running. Uh, and you can see that it's a considerably smaller percentage of your energy now coming from the market uh, than what you saw back here in February of 15. So. Do you know what the average of all that, all those numbers is then? Um, I don't have that number for 17 off the top of my head, but I'll tell you this. It, it, it kind of leads me to this next slide. Oh, okay. Uh, amp recommends that you try to uh, keep about 10% in the market. In, in other words, that you're buying about 10% of your energy from the marketplace. And, and we, we would agree with that. Um, the reason being, you don't never know for sure what your needs are going to be. Your, you know, your energy requirements are going to fluctuate from year to year, especially in your case where you're seasonal. Uh, because of, you know, if we have a mild year, you're obviously your, your needs are going to be less. Uh, and you don't want to get yourself in a situation where you've committed to buy resources, you know, long-term resources, more than what your needs are. Uh, because typically those are going to be higher costs because they're long-term in nature, and you're going to be selling back into a short-term energy market where you're going to be taking a loss uh, and can have a pretty negative impact. In fact, you didn't see it this much uh, as what some of our other clients did back in 08, after 08, uh, but we had, you know, uh, some of the municipals in the state had a lot more energy than they needed when the factories in town mm -hmm. closed down, basically. And now they were selling surplus energy back into the market at half the price of what they were paying for. And they're, you know, obviously affects their power supply costs. So, so yeah. yeah. Lori, the average is 14, if you... When you averaged all those? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, write that down. These next couple of graphs give you kind of an idea of looking out forward. Uh, you know, what, what your load looks like and your energy requirements and your supply. Uh, and again, I give AMP credit for these. Uh, they do a nice job of, of providing this information to us. So we just get to review it. Uh, but this, all these different colors are basically all the different resources. This is the energy graph, by the way, energy supply. Uh, and you can see that 
you know, if we go out here 10 years, then your landfill is going to fall off and your wind's going to fall off. Uh, and you can see that your shortfall is going to be, for energy is going to be much higher. But for the next foreseeable years anyway, uh, you know, I think you're, you're going to be kind of in that range of where, uh, you know, where you probably need to be. Uh, there's probably a little bit of room there. I think we talked about that back when you, you know, when you were looking at how much solar you were allowing behind the meter, uh, was kind of, you know, taking this into account, so. Uh, on the capacity side, uh, you can see this black line is your projected load, um, and the green line is adding on that 15% reserve margin that uh, PJM requires. Uh, and then you can see, again, stacked up all the resources uh, that you've got uh, going forward. This, uh, this one here is the JB2 that falls off, or expected to fall off after 17. So, uh, so you can see you have a, a little more of a need for additional capacity, uh, and primarily peaking capacity, uh, as opposed to base load capacity. The hydro units are going to provide pretty much uh, all of your base load energy requirements uh, for the foreseeable future. So, uh, so most of what you need are really peaking capacity, more so than uh, than base load or intermediate. Uh, and in fact, again, and this is the amp slide, but uh, you know their conclusions are that really there's no major need at this time for more energy resources. Um, and for capacity, um, you, know, you know, again, the peaking projects uh, are really probably your biggest need, and, and that would be things like solar or gas-fired peaking units, which are uh, fairly cost-effective for peaking capacity. So. And I think this last slide, and I, I debated whether to put this in here, but you're going to see it in the next presentation anyway. Um, you'll see these numbers again, but this gives you an idea of somewhat of what the impact of the hydro plants are going to have on your overall power supply cost. Over the last several years, in fact, um, you know, back in 2013, your power cost was just over five cents a kilowatt hour, um, and uh, last year about five and a half cents. Amps projecting that this year at 8.7. The good news is the hydros have not come on yet, so you're probably not going to reach this number this year. Uh, but once they do come on, you're going to see a, a pretty good jump in power costs. And then again, you can see the overall uh, effect. The nice thing about the hydros are once you get there. You're going to have fairly stable costs because it's 90% debt. That debt's not going to change for the life of that debt. Um, ideally, it could come down in the future, possibly, to refinance and, and take advantage of it. So, but that gives you kind of a feel for, you know, where your power supply costs are going to be going in the future. So, I think I'm down to the end of this. Uh, hopefully, mm -hmm. yeah, this presentation. It should have lasted a half hour, so <coughs> we'll see if we can go any faster. Any other questions on the fire side supply before we go to the electric case study? As I said before, you, you uh, hired us back earlier this year to do an electric rate and cost of service study. Um, and we've been working on that uh, the last couple of months, met several times with, with Patty and Johnny and uh, Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I said earlier, we're, it's not complete, as you'll see, uh, but at least we've got enough to show you where we're at. And, and again, we'll need some feedback from you uh, really before we move into this, uh, the next step of the study. The scope of services for the study basically break into these four steps. Uh, first is what we call the revenue requirement analysis. That's where we're going to project your revenues and project your expenses uh, to see if you're getting enough revenue to cover those expenses. Um, next step is once we've done that is to do what we call cost of service analysis. We're going to take those revenue requirements and we're going to allocate those to each of the classes of service, residential, commercial, um, you know, large power, uh, basically you have, you know, those different classes, uh, and compare those to the revenues that you get from those classes to see if you're getting the right amount of revenue from that or, or not. Um, and then the next step once we complete that is to review your rates. Um, and those are the three steps that we basically have gotten through so far. Uh, then the last step is to develop new rates to the extent that there, you need to develop new rates. Um, so uh, that would be completed uh, at a later date. Um, with regard to the revenue requirement analysis, it basically breaks into these five steps. Uh, first, we need to project energy sales, and the reason for that is energy sales drive everything else. They drive power supply requirements and costs. They drive revenues at current rates. 
Uh, and so that's the, the starting always the starting point for us. We take a look at historical data, uh, historical sales data, try to analyze that, make sure that uh, what we have is representative of what you should be building or will be building going forward. Um, and uh, you know, before we move on to the next steps, um, once we got the energy sales projected, again we project power supply requirements and costs. Um, the power supply requirement side is tied to our energy sales projection. The cost actually comes from AMP. I'll be honest. I do these pool projections and all these costs of all these different resources is not something that you want to pay me to do. Uh, AMP does that for us, does that for you, and provides it to us, and we build that into our projection. So um, then we project revenues at current rates. And the reason we have to project cost, power costs first, is I'm sure you're all aware that you have a power supply cost adjustment provision in your rates, where you see you know the fluctuation each month based on actual power supply cost. And so your rates are designed to do that, and actually have allowed you to keep your rates in place for a long time, your base rates, uh, without uh, any real adjustment. So um, after we've projected revenues at current rates, then we're going to project the revenue requirements, or as I always say, the cost to operate and maintain the electric system here in the village. Uh, and then the last is to compare the revenues to the revenue requirement to see if, uh, if you're getting enough revenue. So, uh, so with that, projected energy sales, you can see broken <coughs> down by rate class. Uh, we identified four rate classes, residential, commercial, single phase, that's what that little symbol <coughs> means, commercial three phase, and large power. That's the way you kind of break out your billing data. Uh, you know, from the building operation. Uh, you can see the total sales is about 30 million kilowatt hours a year, um, and roughly half uh, is residential, pretty close to half. Um, now, for purposes of this study, we've assumed no increase uh, in sales. Uh, and typically when we do a rate study, that's what we're going to assume. Try to be conservative. Uh, obviously, if you have it, and it, 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 it noted before, AMP's projecting, you know, eight-tenths of a percent growth, but that's for planning purposes. And obviously for planning, it's a little different than when you're setting rates because if I assume that your, your sales are going to grow at eight-tenths of a percent or one percent or two percent a year and they don't, well, then you're probably not going to end up with the revenue that I thought you were going to have. Um, and so to be conservative, we use a zero percent growth rate uh, unless there's something that we can point to to say, no, we see something that's going on and, and we'll make that adjustment. In particular, we did, in the case of your large power class, uh, we reduced the sales to Antioch College because of the installation of their solar project. So if you looked historically at the data, um, it was uh, you know, about a million and a half, million three kilowatt hours higher for the large power class than what we've got projected going forward. Who because else again, do we have in that class? Uh, you know, I haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, YSI, uh, mm -hmm. uh, EnviroFlight, YSI, Exalum, um, EnviroFlight. The hotel will be in that class. Okay. Friends Care? Friends Care is in that class. And what separates that from commercial? Are the schools in that are class? The schools are in that. Uh, the large versus the three phase is over, I believe it's over 50 kW. Yeah, it's typically going to be by size. The, the larger accounts are going to end up in the large power rate or smaller accounts and small businesses, uh, you know, downtown, mm -hmm. whatnot, shops right. are typically going to be on either commercial single or three phase. Um, and, and you have a different rate, as you'll see later, a different minimum actually for a three phase than you do for a single phase. And, and because you broke that out separately in your billing data, we, we kept it as a separate class okay. in our model. So. Um, now, once we projected those energy sales, we can project power supply requirements. As footnote one says, uh, the, the figures there include unbilled losses of about 8%. Um, you sell about 92% of the kilowatt hours that you that you acquire, that you buy, that come into the system. And that's pretty typical. Actually, it's pretty pretty low uh, for a community of this, you know, for a system of this size. Um, so, uh, you know, we bump up the sales to reflect, you know, the purchases. Keep in mind, 8% is not, when I call it unbilled, that means it's, Kilowatt hours, it may be for services that you don't charge, maybe for, you know, for street lights, for example, you don't even meter. Um, or it could be line losses and transformer losses. In fact, it would include line losses and transformer losses. Transformers will heat up with no load on them. They'll actually consume electricity. Just by hooking power to them, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll consume electricity. So, and wires do as well. So, in fact, meters, well, the old meters, the old mechanical meters would actually consume electricity even though there's no load on the load side of them. So. Um, so again, 8% is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty low. For, we normally like to see it somewhere in the 8 to 12% range. Mm -hmm. You're at the low end of that range. So, 
Now, the power cost projections are over here to the right. And again, those came from AMP. Um, and you can see we're looking at about 8.7 cents this year, 9.6 next year, and about 10 cents in 2017. So. <coughs> now, once we projected uh, the power supply requirements and costs, we can project your revenues. And again, as I said before, it's because you've got a power supply cost adjustment, as you see down here in the, in the footnote, uh, based on the projected power cost for 2016, or excuse me, 15, uh, that number is about 3.73. So, uh, so you can see what that number looks like. Um, we've got uh, average revenues then, including that adder. For residential is about 11.2 cents. For the commercial is about 11.03. Uh, commercial single phase, commercial three phase about 10.13. And for the large power about 9.73. So uh, total revenue. Uh, with that adder, uh, you can see is about uh, $3,205,000. Okay. Well, the next step then is to project revenue requirements, and this is, gives you kind of a summary of that. Uh, and by the way, the revenue requirement model, as well as the cost of service model that I'm going to talk about in a little bit, uh, Patty's got a copy of. Uh, we sat down with her and John, Johnny, and uh, Melissa went through it, and she's got copies. I'm sure if anybody wants to see the, all the detailed numbers that go behind this, uh, they're, they're in that model. Uh, you see the power supply costs there on line one. Uh, other O&M costs, um, that would be things like uh, personal services, you know, labor, material supplies, uh, you know, contractual services. Uh, kilowatt hour tax, uh, you pay kilowatt hour tax to your general fund and to the state of Ohio based on, you know, to, to your general fund based on kilowatt hour sale or deliveries inside your corporate limits and to the state of Ohio for any deliveries outside. Uh, we provide allowance for capital outlay of 250000 a year. Again, and by the way, with the exception of power costs, basically all the expenses are escalated at 3% inflation. Um, now, you do have a truck lease payment uh, that is fixed, as you can see. Um, and then uh, some other minor non-operating expense of about $1,000. And then we found, <laughs> when we met uh, with Melissa, we found, too, that you have this uh, transfer in. It's actually a payment to the electric fund for debt that the electric fund paid off a few years ago. We weren't aware of that, and we were kind of, kind of a curveball for us because we didn't know you'd done that. We were actually still projecting the old debt service number for the electric fund uh, when, we, when we first came down here. But uh, we found out that you actually paid that off, and you're receiving back from the general fund that share that, uh, of that debt that was retired that uh, basically should come from should have come from the general fund. on this building. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, we retired the debt on this building. <coughs> and then all those expenses, well, we credit, well, obviously, that's a credit back uh, against your revenue requirement as well as the uh, any other miscellaneous income. So you can see for 15, we're showing about just shy of $3.9 million. Uh, revenue requirement, about 4.2 in 16 and about 4.5 in 17. And the, um, the Bryan Center payment does end next year. Yeah. So that's why yeah. that is only Yeah, it won't have that in 17. Mm -hmm. <coughs> What's the truck? Yes. Um, That's the new line truck that we leased for five years. Oh, okay. Now the next step then is to determine the overall revenue adjustment that would be needed to meet those revenue requirements. And you can see that in 2015 we're actually projecting a shortfall of about $687,000 or 21.5%. 20, now. I'm going to address that for you a little bit later. Don't get too alarmed with that number. There's a reason why that's much larger than the, the next two years, and it's not just that $69,000 credit that you're getting back uh, you know, from the general fund. Uh, it has to do with how your power cost adder works. But, but for 16 and 17 going forward, uh, basically what we're showing is that your revenues are about 9% shy of meeting your revenue requirement. And in fact, if you look historically, you've been seeing a decline in the fund balance in the electric fund over the last uh, several years. So. I don't think it probably comes as a surprise to most of you, at least if you've been looking at the historical data. So, um, but as I said, the, the 15 number, don't get too focused on the 21 and a half. Um, that's basically because the way your power cost adder works, you're deferring recovery uh, into the future. And uh, we've got some suggestions on how to fix that problem uh, yet this year. So. Um, so our conclusions and recommendations with regard to the revenue requirement analysis are that the revenues at current rates are not sufficient to meet the revenue requirement, um, and that you would need to raise revenues by about 9% overall in order to meet that revenue requirement. Now, I'm not saying 9% for everybody. I'm just saying in general, you need to raise revenues, mm -hmm. and I didn't say rates, revenues by about 9% to 
to meet revenue requirement. Any questions on the revenue requirement before we move into cost of service? Yeah. Oh, that is my hand. Okay. Um, the next step in the analysis then is what we call the cost of service analysis, and we do what we call an unbundled cost of service. Um, and this flow chart, I think, you know, gives you a pretty good idea of how this works. We start out at the top with the revenue requirements that we just talked about, and we're going to take those revenue requirements and we're going to spread them, or, or, or you know, functionalize those, I should say, into three different major cost functions. Power supply, delivery service, and customer services. Power supply is pretty easy to identify because it's basically the cost of acquiring the power and getting it delivered to your system, to your interconnect with DPNL. All those things we talked about in Power Supply 101 basically fall into this power supply category. Um, delivery service then is the cost that basically it takes to get the power from where it comes in, you know, at your interconnect with Dayton Power and Light to your customer's meters. So that's what we call delivery service costs. And that's going to be primarily, you know, line crew costs, uh, maintenance of the system, um, you know, supplies and materials associated with that. Um, and then, and, and, and a capital, and I guess you should say capital costs are also associated with that. Um, and then customer services costs are things that take place at the meter. And in fact, you can kind of see, you know, things like meter reading, billing, collection costs. So, so now we take these, these three different uh, functions and we sub-functionalize those into demand and energy related. And this is getting back to the question you had earlier. Um, a portion of your demand of your power supply cost is, is energy related. It varies based on how much energy you buy. Okay, uh, you know things like fuel, but like the hydro plants, for example, there isn't a lot of variable cost there because it's mostly that um, you know, you're not buying fuel to, to, to uh, basically get power out of, out of a hydro plant. Um, the uh, the demand related though are things like debt service associated with power supply resources or demand charges. Uh, but then in addition to that, we've got those capacity costs from PJM, those capacity charges we talked about, as well as transmission charges from Dayton Power and Light, uh, which are, are basically a fixed or a demand related cost. So, so we've subcategorized these into demand and energy related. We do delivery service costs. Really none of those are very based on the amount of energy a customer uses. Uh, it's really all related to either demand or customer related costs. And demand costs would, you know, Again, you've got to size facilities, for example, to meet the peak demand on the system. But as I tell people, you also have to have enough wires and poles to get to every customer. And so those costs kind of get allocated between demand and customer related. Um, and then customer service, again, as I said before, those are primarily things like meter reading and billing collection costs, mostly labor. Uh, and then, you know, overhead costs or administrative costs associated with the billing operation. So now once we've got these sub-functionalized, then we allocate those to each class based on their contribution to, in the case of demand related costs, their contribution to peak demands. And their energy costs are, are allocated based on their you know, share of energy requirements. Um, and so and the customer related costs are gonna be allocated based on you know, what share of customers. So for example, but now when we do customer related though, we take into account the fact that the cost to serve, for example, a large power customer you know, because he's got it on a demand meter, the, you know, the billing process is a little more complicated. We use what we call a weighting factor. And so it's not just a one for one uh, with regard to uh, allocation of some of these customer related costs. Um, serving a three phase customer, for example, is more expensive than serving a single phase customer. You've got more investment in facilities to serve that customer, both the distribution system as well as the transformers at the site. So, um, this gives you kind of a breakdown of what we call the unit cost of service that we developed from the, from the cost of service study. Um, and this kind of gets to the earlier question a little bit, but, I, uh, uh, but basically what this says is we've got power supply demand related costs that are about almost $27 <coughs> per kilowatt a month. That's a, that's a huge number. Uh, for most of our clients, that number is probably down in the $15 range. Uh, but again, that's, a, that's those hydro plants. So by the way, this is 2017 data. So this is all based on 2017. Um, your energy related costs are a little, just over three cents a kilowatt hour. So on a variable basis, your power supply cost is, is really only about three cents out of that, you know, nine and a half or 10 cents that we're looking at in 2017. <coughs> so back to your question I think you asked earlier, for power supply in 17, it's about 70-30 split. About 70% demand, 30% energy when we get out to 2017 with the high result. Uh, delivery service demand costs, uh, about $5.65 per kilowatt month. Um, and, and by the way, this data 
is used not only to allocate the cost to each class, but we also use this when we're looking at rate design and then what things that we uh, need to do with your rates. Delivery service customer costs are about $9.90 per weighted customer per month. And then your meter reading and billing costs, you can see, are about $283 and $358 per month each. Uh, those combined, by the way, are what, about uh, $6.40 and, and or so. Um, so again, we use this data not only to allocate costs to the classes, but we're also going to use this when we get down to trying to develop things we need to take a look at with your rates. So. Uh, and then I think this even gets you a bigger picture of uh, answer to your question earlier. Uh, you know, for 2017, your demand-related costs are about 64%, or roughly two-thirds of your cost overall revenue requirement. Energy-related costs are about 25% of your overall cost, uh, and customer-related costs are about 11%. Um, and that's, the, the, those numbers are, are not, the 11% is probably fairly typical. <laughs> Uh, what's probably not as typical for most of our clients is the 64 25 split. Again, because most of our clients are not as heavily into the hydro as what is what you're you know, going to be in 2017. So, um, kind of ironic. I we, I did a quick analysis of your rate of your, your revenue stream. You know the way you charge customers, and you do have a demand charge in your large power rate, as you'll see in a little bit. But about 90% of your revenue is generated by an energy charge and only about 10% is generated by customer and demand charges, or what we would call a customer or minimum charge and demand charges. So you can see there's quite a difference between, you know, 25% of your cost is energy related, yet you recoup 90% of your cost on an energy basis. So yeah. uh, for other communities or areas, what is the more normal ratio between the demand and energy related? Probably closer to about uh, half of the balance. Uh, so if you take out the 10% or so for customer related, it's about 45% each. They're about balanced. Um, again, you're going to have very low energy costs because of the hydros. Most of our clients, uh, we've done some <coughs> recently, are probably looking at four cent energy costs. You're looking at three cent energy costs. Um, so I'm still learning this. So would you uh, review what the demand entails? Well, demand. The, the, well, demand itself is is peak load, peak yeah, rate yeah, of usage. Yeah. But, I mean, From a cost perspective, the things that make up demand-related costs are going to be things like debt service on on resources. So the debt service that you pay on the hydros is all demand-related because it doesn't vary based on how many kilowatt hours come out of that plant. Okay. Um, a certain portion of O and M costs, Fremont, for example. You know, you've got fuel there, so you've got some gas that's going to be an energy-related cost because if you don't burn it, if you don't generate, you don't burn the gas. But you've got labor costs that are that you're paying, and you've got debt service costs that you're paying that are fixed costs that are typically allocated on a demand basis. Now, some of that, some of that labor cost will actually get on a allocated on a variable basis because you'll have a little more labor cost if you run the plant than if you never ran it at all. Uh, it kind of, you know, but not a lot of it, but a portion of it does get allocated to variable. But most of it's going to be fixed or demand related. So, but demand costs are going to be things that are fixed that don't vary based on the amount of energy you use. Energy related costs are things that vary because you're either getting more energy, you know, or, or, or delivering more energy to the customer. So, I don't know if that answered your question. It was a long yes, answer yes, to your question. Yes, thank you, Ryan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the cost of service results, and, and here we're going to compare the revenue at current rates for each class to what the cost of service results indicate as the cost of serving that class. And again, as the footnote says, this is 2007 uh, revenues and, and test year for the cost of service. So we're, we're taking revenues from a comp for the comparable year with the same power cost built in. Um, and you can see for the residential class, your revenues at current rates are about two point, a little over 2.1 million. Cost of service says you ought to be almost 2.4 million, so a shortfall of about 267 or 268 thousand dollars, or what it says is residential revenues need to go up about 12.7 percent to meet cost of service. Okay, keep in mind, overall we're looking at 9.2 percent overall revenue increase. So, now commercial single phase, on the other hand, the same numbers going across says it's about 20 to be go up about 29 percent. So it says you're really under recovering on your on your commercial single phase rates. Can you? I, I hate to ask, but yeah. what's the difference between single phase and single phase means you basically power comes in you know 
basically three phases. I mean, it, it gets a little complicated if you're not familiar with it, but. Uh, <laughs> Johnny's uh, laughing. Uh, but basically, um, <laughs> most large customers are going to be served at what we call three phase. Uh, in other words, they're going to have three transformers uh, that basically supply the power to their facility, where okay. most residential and small commercial are going to be single phase. Oh, okay. So they only so have one a, transformer because they don't smaller, have they don't have three smaller phase commercial motors. entities. Yeah, are no, Johnny, no, normally that's, three phase that's good enough. I don't need to know. Well, I would more. like. I mean, could you downtown businesses mostly majority are three phase. Three phase. Three. They are three phase yeah. because they're large buildings. Yeah, because. <clears throat> The power costs for the HVAC units and all that, they can run what, what three phase. 277. Yeah. I was going to say, what, what drives the customer's need is what their equipment is. And usually larger customers have large motorized equipment, that, and it's more efficient to operate a three-phase motor than a single-phase motor. You can do single-phase motors. Tom's got, it's more Tom's efficient Mark has got both. Uh, some of the buildings downtown have got motors. Uh, the majority of them are three-phase. Okay. Okay. All right. Now, for the, for the three phase, you can see that it's closer to where the residential's at. Uh, mm -hmm. You're looking at about 12.3% mm -hmm. um, uh, shortfall there. And the large power class, on the other hand, actually says the revenues that you're collecting from them exceeds the cost of providing service. So, so it actually shows that uh, you know, large power is, is over collecting relative to cost of service. So. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, you know, engineer that can't work for a lot of pictures. Uh, so we had to put it in the graph. This gives you kind of a relative uh, impact, you know, you know, residential looking at about 12.7, you know, 28.8 for commercial single, 12.3, and then uh, negative 5.2 for the large power class. Keep in mind, this is with an overall adjustment required of about 9.2%. So anybody that's, anybody that's above 9.2% is being subsidized by anybody that's below 9.2%. So basically what it says is that the large power class is subsidizing the res residential and commercial classes. And that doesn't surprise me when we started looking at, when we looked at revenues from the very beginning. Because your large power class average revenues are almost as high as all the other classes. I think they were 9.7 and the other classes are just over 10 or around 10 or 11 cents. So it doesn't surprise me to find that. Uh, unless you had some really poor load factor large power customers, then you don't. Mm -hmm. Most of them have fairly good load factors, actually. So, um, now, what, what, basically, what this tells us is, though, future rate adjustments should move this revenue distribution towards the cost of service. Now, I'll be the first to tell you, cost of service changes all the time. In fact, you could get somebody else up here to do this study, and they're going to get a slightly different result mm -hmm. because some of this is subjective. Okay? Yeah, of course. But I don't think they would be drastically different. I think you'd still end up with the study saying large power classes subsidizing other classes. So, uh, so w when you make changes, I mean, th the worst thing you could do is just say, well, we need 9% increase, let's just raise everybody 9%. Mm -hmm. Because you're just going to continue to perpetuate the problem that large power is subsidizing the other classes. Now, I'm not saying you can't do that, but that just, you know, perpetuates the, the inequity in, in the way the rates are now. Uh, so what you should try to do is move towards this now. Do you ever get there? Probably not. Uh, but you should at least make changes in your rates or your revenue distribution that move you towards it. So you, you try to head that direction. Um, doesn't mean you're going to get all the way there. I can tell you right now, you're probably not going to raise a commercial single phase class 29%. Yeah. Uh, because you'll have this room full of people screaming <laughs> uh, when you raise oh, an yeah, overall 9.2. Okay. As a general rule, <laughs> what we try to do is we try to say um, we won't raise any class more than twice the overall revenue increase. So in this case, we'd be saying we would limit anybody to about 18% for, by class. Mm -hmm. By class. By class. Yeah. So, uh, but again, that's your call. And, that, and that's the part I need feedback from you on going mm -hmm. forward uh, is, you know, how would you like to distribute this overall adjustment uh, amongst the classes? Mm -hmm. can, can you explain why, the, why there is such a big difference with the, the single phase commercial? Uh, well, that's because of the way your rates are, unfortunately. Uh, and, and those are those are small customers that you're not recovering those fixed costs, those demand-related costs. But let me walk through the rates, and I, I think I can okay. answer your question a little better. For you. But let me let me kind of <coughs> jump ahead. Um, so uh, basically, you know, again, you know, these were the results of the cost of service. Um, next step is to review your existing rates, compare those rates to the cost of service. Remember, we talked about those unit costs. 
uh, and try to identify where there are problems, and, and that's, that's basically what we're trying to do. Uh, lastly is to develop new rates, but again, we need that feedback from you on revenue distribution because I need to know how mm -hmm. much revenue do I need to get before I can design the rate to get you there. So, uh, By the way, your, your base rates were last uh, adopted in May of 2007, at least that's what uh, your codified ordinances say, with the exception of the kilowatt hour tax, which was adopted in 2001 they, uh, uh, when it was uh, basically implemented. Um, your residential rate looks like this. You have um, basically an energy charge where the first hundred is at $10, and that's also the minimum. So you're building into the minimum 100 kilowatt hours of usage. Mm -hmm. um, the next 400 kilowatt hours are at seven cents per kilowatt hour. The next 1100 are at six cents per kilowatt hour, and everything over that is 16, over 1600 is at five cents a kilowatt hour. So these are what we call declining block rates, pretty common. Um, although we're seeing more of a trend to try to consolidate into single or maybe two block rates. Um, but, but again, it's not an uncommon rate structure uh, given back in 2007 timeframe. So um, in addition to that, you have a power cost adjustment uh, that's applied to every kilowatt hour. And that varies monthly based on your actual power supply cost. And again, I'm going to kind of walk you through that adder a little bit. Uh, and then that kilowatt hour tax, as I said, it's basically tied to directly to the Ohio Revised Code Section 572781, which established the uh, kilowatt hour tax back in 2001. Uh, your commercial single phase has a, uh, again, like the residential, has the first 100 kilowatt hours at a flat $15, which is the minimum. Um, the next 900 kilowatt hours at seven cents, the next 2200 at six cents, and everything over 3200 at uh, five and a half cents. Again, you got the power cost adder and the kilowatt hour tax, just like the residential rate. So, um, oh, did we lose the slide? Yeah, we're missing the three phase. Is it in? Is it in yours? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, I apologize. Um, yeah, that's what I missed. Don't know what happened. Um, well, the commercial three phase, I think, is the same with just a higher customer minimum charge. Yeah. 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 So that, but the, the individual, the you know 900 that, kilowatts, yeah. that's all can the same. Just, what can is you it? just tell us what those numbers are? You got that, Scott? Because um, is it 20? Uh, I think it's in the file. Maybe he can. We can come back to yeah, that when he finds okay. it. Go over right. large power. All right. I apologize for that. I thought it was in there. I'll tell you, we've had gremlins in our computer for the last week. It <laughs> it's happens. Been, it's been kind of crazy. Um, large power is basically you have uh, a capacity charge. Now, this is where we get into a demand-related charge. It's called a capacity charge of $6.50 per KVA. I don't know that you're metering. Are you metering KVA, Johnny? You're metering KW. 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 That's why I kind of figured. Um, and we won't get into that whole discussion, but suffice it to say it's six fifty per KW. Um, energy charge, they're, they're, they're somewhat synonymous. Uh, energy charge uh, of 3.9 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and then again, the power cost adder and the kilowatt hour tax. Um, and by the way, maybe kind of clarify some, why we have some of the discrepancy problems um, with the large power in particular being that it, it's subsidizing other classes. Since 2007, you have been passing on power cost increases on a per kilowatt hour basis, okay? In other words, even though some of that power cost increase has been related to demand-related costs, you pass it all on on an energy charge basis, on the, on the power cost adder. And that starts to distort as it gets bigger. That adder is starting to get bigger. And it's going to get a lot bigger when the hydros come on. And, and so this is something you really need to address going forward. Um, but that's why your rates get a little out of whack with cost of service is because, and, 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 and you're not alone in this, we have other clients who do the same thing because it's just easier to do. I mean, it's easier to pass on those power costs on a kilowatt hour basis. Right. But it's when that number starts getting big, you've got to say, okay, let's step back. Let's do a cost of service again. AMP actually recommends that you do that about every five years. We say you should do it when there's a major change in the way you buy, you know, your power supply costs and that relationship with demand and energy or a big change in your load. Like you lose a customer or gain a customer, you know, big customer. Um, but Hey, AMP says every five years, I'll go with it because it just gets me more work. So. <laughs> <laughs> They're our best advertisers. Um. Um, speaking of that power supply cost adjustment, uh, as it says here, basically it's uh, adjusted every month 
but it's based on a rolling 12-month average power supply cost. And this is what's creating, going to create the problem for you going forward. Uh, so each month, you calculate the average power supply cost for the last 12 months, looking back. You compare that to 3.7 cents a kilowatt hour. That 3.7 is what your average cost of power was when you set the rates back in 07. Okay? Then you, in, you adjust that for losses, and you use a 10% loss, even though, even though your actual is about 8%. Um, because that's probably what it was back in 2007. It's probably about 10%. Um, and what happens is, it's okay as your power cost is fairly stable because your adder stays fairly stable and you're meeting your cost. But what happens is, is when your power cost starts to increase, you end up with this. And this is what you're gonna look like now. It hasn't started quite as drastically this year because the hydros haven't started up yet and you're not being billed for them. But you can see what happens. This red line is your one month average power, actual power cost. And this is, by the way, these are based on projections provided by AMP, um, you know, the red line. The 12 month is, uh, the, I think it's black or blue, I can't tell, it's a blue schedule? Black. 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 Yeah, black. black. That's the rolling 12 months. So that's what's being used to calculate your power cost adder. But yet your power cost is this red line up above. So all of this differential between here is getting deferred. It's being pushed out for recovery in a later time. What we're recommending is, is that you go to a three month rolling average. And most of our clients, virtually all of our clients have gone to at least a six month, if not a three month. Um, and this green line shows you what the effect would be of going to a three month rolling average. It, it accelerates the recovery. It, it, it you know, minimizes that deferral period so that your recovery of cost is closer in line with when you incur the cost. And we, we think this is something you really need to do. If you remember, I told you that, that shortfall that you know, in 2015 was 600 and some thousand, half of that is because of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if you fix that, then you're only looking at the other half, the 9% or so that you need to do something with rates. So. so who does that? Do we come to you or does Melissa, is Melissa able or our billing company? It has to Actually, be. I've already drafted it for you. That's okay. why you yeah, have that's why he, yeah, that's why he drafted it. at your table. Yeah, and, and so really that's something that you need to do fairly You would just quick. say do that right away. Right away, because Even you need to get ahead of it before these, these hydro costs start coming on, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the rate review though, these are our conclusions. You know, the existing customer charges are below the uh, customer related costs. In fact, you really don't have customer charges per se, you have minimum charges. And, mm -hmm. and if you back into the number, for example, if you take the residential and say, well, if I build that first 100 kilowatt hours at seven cents, which is the same for the next 400, I really only have about a $3 customer charge. That's really what it equates to. Right. Well, your right. cost is $15. If you add up all your customer related costs, we go right. back here, you've got 990, 283, and and 358, all of those costs combined, which is over $15, mm -hmm. is customer related, but you're charging basically the equivalent of a $3 customer charge. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's the same for all classes. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you kind of have that situation. So, um, so that's obviously one of the issues we have with the rates. Uh, the commercial rates don't track with the cost of service, and that's because they don't have that demand charge in them. Uh, now, I'm not gonna suggest you run out and put a demand meter on everybody and build them demand tomorrow, okay? <laughs> because again, you'll have this room full of people. But you need to start the transition. And what well, most of our clients who don't currently have demand charges for commercial, what we recommend is all new customers go on a demand energy rate, or at least all customers of a given size. Now maybe we allow smaller five kilowatt type load customers to stay on a non-demand rate, but all you know, medium sized customers, would, if they're new, would go to a demand rate. But we would grandfather all the existing customers on the non-demand rate if they want to stay there now. If they, if they can save money on the demand rate, because it's possible they could. If they're, you know, if they're running refrigeration equipment that runs around the clock, runs all night long, they might be better off moving to that new demand energy rate. But, but that's the type of thing that we typically try to do is to transition you so that you start moving in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, and also start to gather the data. In other words, start to put demand meters on everybody, don't necessarily bill them on them but start to gather data so that we can use that data for rate purposes. And they could use it perhaps for? Well, it, it's information that they, you know, they would know what their load is, uh, mm -hmm. and, but, um, but really it's more for you to know. Right. I mean, it helps us in the cost of service how to allocate costs. Okay. But more importantly, it helps down the road to get rates in line with cost of service, so, yeah. So are you using demand in the same way that you were using it in the draft, in other words, Demand was all the fixed charges that we incurred 
not including the cost of the energy? That's the, well, that's the that's how the rate would look if you did yeah. fair and cost of service. Demand in evidence, when I'm talking about a demand meter on the customer, we're trying to record their highest rate of usage, their okay. highest demand. Okay, so mm -hmm. it's a different definition. So that we can apply a rate to that demand, like we do, you do this now with large power, okay? With large power customers, you bill, okay, that's uh, you call it capacity charge, Is it, it's the equivalent of a demand charge. It well, tries to recover those capacity, those demand related costs <coughs> on a demand basis as opposed to an energy basis. So my question is, I guess, Given that for our costs as the village, we have fixed costs, which are <coughs> mostly what you're determining demand costs, but we're not charging any kind of d demand. We're no. not charging any sort of fixed base costs to any of our customers. Just a large power. Okay, so Just would you power. recommend that we start doing that for residential and? Well, I recommend it for commercial, definitely. And as I said, you may want to transition to that and allow customers to stay on non-demand for some time. You know, in other words, I wouldn't do it overnight. But residential, we typically don't see demand-related rates in residential. Why not? Well, Ohio Edison tried this several years ago. Back when I kind of started cutting my teeth in this business in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, Ohio Edison put everybody on an, every residential customer on a demand meter, uh, and it wasn't long that they ended up doing away with it. And the reason was, now, now you can still opt for that if you want as a customer and be billed that way, but what they did was they found out that the customers just didn't have a hard time adjusting to it and understanding it. And, what, and, and they actually had it on a time of use basis, so that if you used your dryer at night, you know, it set less of a demand, it was an off-peak demand, if you didn't run it during the day, it would save you money. Uh, but customers had, had a hard time adjusting. So I'm not that, so. using demand, and I'm using the demand in the sense that you were originally using it that we pay for our fixed costs. We don't charge any. We don't charge our uh, resident residential customers a base fixed cost. I mean, we charge. Yeah, uh, we, an we, do, we do. We do. It's, it's just, just not high it's just enough. enough. It's just not, yeah. It's, yeah. But it's for the first Effectively, hundred. It's, it's the first ten. But it's a, it's a basic yeah. readiness for service charge. Okay, that's what yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah. 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 It's, it's supposed to be, but it's not. Not yeah. reflective of cost. Yeah. 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 So Far so let me change the words. Would you recommend that we increase our readiness to serve charge? Yes, that's the first item we have on the list. Okay. Existing customer charges are below customer related costs. So that's okay. the first step is getting that, that customer charge. And by the way, just to give you a kind of a, a comparison, the, the rural electric cooperatives, uh, some of them in the state have raised their, their customer charge. It was, used to be $3, $5 a month to $35 and $40 a month. And that's what we're seeing in their world. Uh, they're starting to say, hey, we want to make sure we, we recover our fixed costs. And then the energy portion of the bill is basically power supply costs. And so they, they want to make sure they're getting that money back for getting that readiness to serve that power to, you know, to the customer, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what they use. Right. So, uh, but yeah, we're seeing that uh, at least in the, in the rural electric cooperatives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just, just so everybody's, when the new meters come online uh, in July or whatever, they will all be capable of reading demand. We just will only use it as we're doing now but even residential meters will know what their demand is right so are you do you have a schedule is it it is it a, it a geographic schedule of how you're changing them out or is it by user I'm probably type gonna start on one of the town and work my work way so out. it doesn't matter I mean no. all of them will get mm -hmm. okay But the, if we went to demand charges, it could incentivize people to say, I'm going to run my washer and dryer at night. I'm going to put my, well, my you dishwasher could, you could certainly time. You could certainly offer that as an option to a customer to have that optional rate. And again, mm -hmm. Ohio Edison continued that demand that, you know, that, that type of rate as an option to customers if they wanted to stay on it. Mm -hmm. but the majority of the cut by far. They couldn't. They, they it, it, it's back too to the, confusing. To the regular for regular, energy but regular as we, non nerdy yeah. people. But as we get to smart, you know, all of the smart programming and things, I mean, it's going to be easier for people to do that. Mm -hmm. how, how does energy efficiency um, play work all into this? this and well, actually, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up because arguably I should have had uh, efficiency smart as one of your resources because actually it is a resource. Mm -hmm. uh, and AMP actually considers it to be a resource. Um, but uh, we've not reflected in our projections anyway, again, we're assuming zero growth, uh, 
but we so I guess you could argue that we've maybe assumed that your growth is going to get offset by efficiency. Um, but uh, you certainly do have and, and are part of the Efficiency Smart program, which gives customers the opportunity to reduce their usage um, and uh, and save money that way as well. So, uh, but we've not factored that into our analysis specifically. Uh, again, you could argue that you know it kind of offsets that eight tenths of a percent growth that AMP's anticipating mm -hmm. uh, because we've used a zero percent growth. So. Um, Let's see, I think the next amount here was a high load factor, large, cust large power customers are subsidizing low load factor. And that's again because you've got a $6.50 demand charge when we're looking at, you know, well over $30 demand cost uh, per kilowatt month. So, um, so again, that's, you know, keep in mind, you got a 3.9 cent energy cost here and you got an adder on top of that that, uh, what was it, 3 something? 373. Three, yeah, 373. So you're charging an energy charge of, you know, almost seven and a half cents, and yet your energy cost is 3.1 cents. So we're so just doing so it, so we're picking, doing it backwards. You're picking up the demand cost on the energy side. And, and so what happens, so what that does, when I talk about high load factor customers, those are guys that, you know, that would be like the grocery stores, okay? Where they have refrigeration that runs all the time, they use a lot of kilowatt hours based, you know, per kilowatt of their peak demand, but yet they're paying for those, those demand costs for that guy who only runs for a few hours during the day, you know, mm -hmm. they're, the grocery store is paying for his demand in the energy charge. And it's really not a fair way to recover it. So, mm -hmm. again, I'm not going to suggest you run out and raise your large power demand rate to $30 a kilowatt for KVA because, again, you'll have this room full of large power mm -hmm. customers. So yeah. um, that's kind of the art of the rate design process. But you try to move that direction. <laughs> we certainly wouldn't want to leave the demand charge where it is or reduce it. Mm. We would want to raise it. So. Uh, and then the last one is that thing we you talked about with the power cost adder, and that's that uh, you know you, you, you know the deferral that you need to address. Um, recommendations on the rates would be to modify the power supply cost uh, adjustment to reflect the three-month rolling so, uh, power supply cost, and that would be kind of immediately um, increase the uh, customer charges again to move towards cost of service results. Develop commercial rates with you know demand and separate demand and energy charges. Um, you know move or increase the large power demand charge, you know, towards cost of service. Uh, and we would also suggest rolling the power cost adder into the base rates. Now, I wouldn't do that with this first fix because, um, you know, we haven't designed the new rates yet. Uh, but when we get down to designing the new rates, we're also going to recommend that we roll part of that power cost adder, or most of it, into the base rates. And so it becomes part of the base rates and we start back down at zero again. So that we've, you know, now we've kind of got it designed into the base rates, and now we're going to start over with a, with a roughly a zero adder. So, um, so kind of summarize the rate study, uh, at least where we're at today. Revenues at current rates are not sufficient to meet the near-term revenue requirements. Um, the cost service says the large power class is subsidizing the residential and commercial classes, and the cost of service says that the rate review says that customer charges are below customer-related costs. And commercial rates don't track with the cost of service. Um, so our recommendation, there were a few others that we didn't put on the list, obviously. Our recommendations are to modify that power cost adder uh, to a three-month rolling average. And again, basically the same recommendations we had before with regard to the rates. So okay. I think that gets me to the last slide. Yeah. Uh, okay. One of the things that we're considering in, in our regular council meetings is um, legislation that will um, put responsibility for utilities on the property owner of a, of a rental property. Okay. So let's say we had a large apartment okay. complex, which now is a 30 little residential users. If that property owner chose to pay everything to pay it all himself, would they become a large power user? Um, it would just depend on what their load is. I don't know if 30, 30 units could possibly get you to that level, uh, that they would fall into the large power rate. And, and a commercial property could potentially be the same where maybe now they're a commercial, small commercial, but it could become a large user and, and potentially become beneficial uh, well, in, in rate structure. Yeah, I mean, I. Whether it's beneficial or not depends on what their load factor is, what the, what the relationship to the demand and energy, whether they would save money or not. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but certainly, if you've got 30 or or 
you know, or more in an apartment complex, I can tell you that most of our clients today would never treat those as separately metered residential customers. They would probably treat it as a commercial service. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that large. Normally the break is, you know, we got three or four or five unit type, you know, and mm -hmm. usually because they've been around, you know, they'll treat those as separately individual metered services. Uh, but, you know, once you start getting in the, in the tens of units, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 units, typically those are going to be served as a commercial service with one meter. And the owner of the property is responsible for, for the bill. So I'm not saying you can't do it the other way, but what they find is the cost of doing that is can get, they can get, get some, very high. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To separately wire each meter you know, for each unit that way. So. Hmm. Are we, I mean, I, we haven't had any apartment complexes built that we would even have that, you know, that kind of an assessment or that kind of a decision to make. Um, no, but Antioch's thing could have something right. like that mm -hmm. in it. But they're already a large power user, so. Uh, questions? Anybody, any questions from, from citizens? I know that we do have um, a presentation on community yep. solar. Could we take um, a quick break? Quick, sure. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, John's going to talk a little bit about community solar. And before we do, Scott, uh, check the file. And actually, on that commercial rate, the reason we only showed the one rate is it's the same rate that applies to single and three phase. Okay. So that's why we only listed the one slide. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, so yeah, it's no no different which are, whether you're single or three phase. Uh, community solar options. I know this has been a topic of discussion here. Like I say, I was here back in January for one of your meetings uh, where we had uh, yeah, had some discussion about this. And what Patty asked me to do is kind of take a look at some of the options available for community solar type uh, uh, you know, option for your customers and uh, talk about some of the, uh, you know, the different ways you could do this. And, and, and there are probably even more than, obviously there are more than these, uh, but these are, you know, four different options that we see that probably, um, are the, you know, something you would, you know, probably want to consider pursuing. Um, the first would be the customer owned, which I think is the option that you've been hearing from, I think, the Energy Board, um, where customers own individual panels. Um, and, uh, well, we'll talk about some of the differences, the pros and cons of these. But, um, the, an, you know, an alternative to that would be village owned, where the village would actually build and own the project. Uh, and we understand, at least, that the, pro that the village has a site available for uh, some amount of solar to be built on. Um, a third option would be to do what we call a third-party PPA. It's basically where a private developer, somebody other than the village, uh, owns and builds the project, but they could build it on the village site. Um, and, uh, and then the village purchases the energy from that developer through a power purchase agreement. And by the way, we have several clients who have projects they're not necessarily being used as solar, uh, community solar for their customers, but we have uh, municipal clients like yourself who have third-party PPA, you know, developer PPA uh, projects in their communities um, already in existence, and we have some that are going up. Uh, uh, Wapakoneta, Oak Harbor, and Beach City all have existing projects in place. Um, Minster is right at the front end of the start of a project. They've got uh, a developer who should be starting construction any day soon. So. Uh, and we're working with a number of other communities and have worked with other communities uh, on negotiating contracts of those types. In fact, we're working with the uh, city of Clyde right now uh, with a, a, a large, well-known developer. I can't say who it is, but um, on, on a project. So, um, so that's certainly an option. Uh, and then recently, um, AMP is actually going to be developing uh, kind of a, a broader-based solar project. But it's kind of a spinoff to that. They are actually offering what they're calling community solar, um, where basically they would build the pro they would own and build the project again on a village site, uh, and the village would purchase the energy from AMP through a power purchase agreement, similar to the third party arrangement, except that you're dealing with AMP, somebody you know, somebody that uh, you're actually a part of. So uh, kind of like you're dealing with yourself. So. But the AMP project may or may not be on our village site. Oh, uh, actually, the community solar that they're proposing would be specifically for okay. you, for your site. Mm -hmm. uh, AMP, AMP's doing kind of a, a again kind of a twofold process on their solar project. One is a is a much bigger scale where they're uh, trying to optimize the cost, uh, minimize the cost, I should say, uh, by building large uh, solar developments on large sites behind the meters of municipal electric utilities or members. 
Um, and then in that case, you could subscribe to that, those projects, or that project as a whole, the aggregate of it, uh, and get, uh, in essence, energy from that. Just like you get energy from Blue Creek Wind, or you get energy from uh, EDI landfill, um, you would get power basically, you know, uh, through a power purchase agreement through AMP. Uh, but in addition to that, and we just found this out a week ago Friday, um, they are also, as a part of that, doing a kind of a smaller scale project where they'll come into your community and build a small scale solar, um, you know, in the, say 100 kilowatt size. Uh, and then that project would be um, kind of the catch is it, we understand it, is that you have to then subscribe to the whole project for twice that. So if you want to put in 100 kilowatts, you subscribe to 200 kilowatts. They'll build the 100 in your site. Um, but you're a part of, you know, and it's, it's part of the whole big project, but then you subscribe for an extra 100 in the, in the bigger project. Uh, the cost, however, will be slightly different for the community solar portion uh, because it's smaller scale. So it won't be the same price as what you pay for the bigger broad picture project because, you know, they're talking about putting in megawatts of size. How many, you know, so. Do you have any idea how many megawatts total they're talking? Um, I'm not sure the total, exact total amount. I think it's in the 60 to 70 megawatt range. I mean, clearly that's going to have to go on multiple sites anyway. Oh, yeah. No, I think it was, it's got 22, 22, 22 different sites. Uh, they had 37 sites when they started. In fact, I think you were actually a site at one time on their list. Uh, they, they whittled it down to 22, and then now uh, they're going around to the sites to, to, to get confirmation of that. Uh, and, they're going, and, and then they're going to be rolling the project out. Uh, when I say roll it out, they'll roll it out for subscription to the, and you'll get a subscription package to decide if you want to be in it. But as a part of that, we understand there'll also be this community solar option that you can do, which is much smaller scale. So. And do you know what size project is kind of the minimum they're willing to I look think at I, a we, single community? I'd say 100 kilowatts is what we heard. But again, we just heard about this a week ago Friday. And I don't know. I don't know if they, they might go smaller than that. I don't know. What does that translate into acreage? Uh, it's about five acres uh, per megawatt, so you'd be looking at a half an acre, yeah, round number. Oh wow! Yeah, not a lot of not a lot of land to do a. To and do what a about this? I mean, so 100 kilowatts for the you know where you have to double your. But what about smallest for the regular project per site? Uh, you can. I don't think there's any minimum size as far as participating in their overall project. Okay. Um, not that I'm aware of. I mean, if you, you could you could subscribe for. 50 kilowatts or 10 kilowatts. I mean, I'm not sure why you would. Mm -hmm. Now, for your side, on your side, but for you know a town like El Dorado, they might want 50 kilowatts or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, now, keep in mind, that doesn't mean they're going to build one in your town, you know, on a site. It means you're just going to be a part of these other projects, you know, these other sites that are being built, and your cost will be the same as everybody else that's in that. Right. So it's kind of like the. Uh, well, kind of like the hydro. I mean, you're building three hydros. It's kind of like the JV2, although that's a little different because it was joint ownership, but kind of like the hydros where you got three units and they're different places, but everybody's in the project together and you share proportionally in the cost. And right. you can sign up for as small as you want or as much as you want, uh, as long as they don't, they can't oversubscribe, obviously. So. Have they identified a single developer? No, they're going to build it themselves. They're not using a developer. Uh, this will be owned by AMP, just like Fremont Energy Center, just like the hydros are owned by AMP. Um, I mean, one of the trade-offs. Um, so they'll be like the general contractor, and they'll. Um, well, they'll be, yeah, but they'll 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 bid it out. In fact, I think yeah. they've already selected, um, or they're working on selecting the contractor because they had to yeah. get prices together, obviously. Um, actually, through an organization called Hometown Connection, um, they um, uh, have aligned with a contractor who. Hometown Connection is a part of APPA, the American Public Power Association, which is the nationwide trade association for public power systems. And they have a, a, a group, a, a, an entity, so to speak, called Hometown Connections, who market services that they've, um, you know, that they've kind of pre-screened and pre-qualified, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, for public for, 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 yeah, for public utilities to use. And so they, they're, you're using a company that's a part of, home, you know, uh, Hometown Connections program, uh, as I understand. It gives a guaranteed price on the construction. You know, once they've identified the sites, uh, they'll get a price guaranteed from the contractor uh, for the installation. So, um, are they looking at greenfields only, or would they consider brownfields? They did. Oh that. no, they'll they'll, uh, they'll consider brownfields. They're doing one yeah. on a what was it, 60-acre junkyard, yeah. Johnny? Yeah, they've already. It's yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, and no, what about rooftops or or? No, these would these would not be uh, these wouldn't be that small so, scale to okay. do them on rooftops. They're, they're looking for again the sites that have been identified are all ground sites right, yeah, that are basically from municipalities. So. Um, a lot of well fields. You know, a lot of people put them on. Uh, some a lot of people put them on their well fields. Um, yeah, it's sure. pretty common. So. Hmm. What kind of uh, time frame? Well, I think they're they're hoping to have some script. Well, they said they were going to have subscription deadline of. Uh, July. July. Yeah, this July. Uh, July. <laughs> Somebody wow. said that. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be honest. I don't think that's going to happen because uh, it just takes a lot more time to that. For community, but they had planned on rolling it out first of April, and here we are, end of April, and we haven't seen numbers yet. Uh, we've attended two presentations on this, and uh, we haven't seen any dollar amounts yet. Um, and it's because it's kind of a chicken egg problem. They got to find out the sites, they got to pin them down to get the price uh, before they can do that, and they're still working on the sites. Uh, and, and I think the site guys are saying, Well, I want to know what I'm going to be paying. <laughs> uh, by the way, if you host a site and not a solar, uh, or, well, it's kind of the same thing with community solar, but if you host a site, you have to take, is it half? Half. So if, let's say you've got a ten, you know, three megawatt uh, site, you've got to take 1,500 in the project. Right. Yeah, you've got to subscribe to at least half of what your site uh, capacity, your capacity is. is. So well, if you host the site, I assume you get some sort of benefit on the rate? Not really on the rate. Um, you, you, uh, you'll get some benefit on... Um, I'm not sure on <laughs> transmission. The capacity you don't get any more than your proportionate share. I'm not sure. I'm not sure on transmission. I don't think we've seen the final outcome on that. So, but I, I, there's not there's not a real big bang for the buck to to host a site other than you've got it in your community. And you know, I'll, I'll be honest. Most of our clients, at least those who um, Amp started a, high, a solar project a few years ago in Napoleon, and that, that was kind of the start of this. It actually started even before that. They were going to do 300 megawatts. Uh, it was a pretty big scale. Never got anywhere because everybody wants a site. Everybody wants to be a site, and you know, uh, and they're not going to put them. I mean, this is, I think what pulled, you know caused them to roll out this community solar because they weren't going to do small scale projects. They were only looking really for the for the lower cost, big size projects. Uh, but no, I, I don't think you do it because there's some additional benefit to you. I think it's because you have it in your backyard, and I think that's really the. The, the motivation for most people wanting to put them in is because they want them in their backyard. Yeah, I can see the hand up back here. John, we had a, a village come we put it in the one in the well field so that they could pump their water and turn the baby into solar power and saw that as a uh, financial savings. You mentioned well fields. Is this yes. true that that would uh, provide the village financial well, the financial benefit to any solar project is the fact that it uh, it's typically going to be operating at near full output on the hot summer day, and hopefully during those hours when the peaks occur. Now, that doesn't always happen to occur that way, but but ideally you'd, you'd like to hope that you get most of that solar. And so the, the real benefit to the solar financially is is basically reducing your capacity requirement. And I'm not now talking about bidding into that auction we talked about. I'm just talking about putting it in behind your meter, behind the village's meter, you know, and reducing the load during the summer peaks. And that has a financial benefit because now you're reducing your peak load contribution that we talked about earlier. I don't know if, if you were here for that. But you reduce your peak load contribution, which saves you money. And if it happens to occur during the peak on the transmission system, which you build for your contribution, you reduce your transmission costs. So that's the real benefit from the from a utilities point of view, is reducing transmission and capacity costs. Um, the energy also comes typically during on-peak, well, it's going to come during on-peak period, at 7 in the morning till you know, 11 at night, but during that period, when energy costs are typically higher than they are at night. So you get the benefit of getting the energy during the higher energy price periods, uh, typically. So you know, that's, that's the real benefit to it. Uh, I mean, the trade-off is you've got fixed cost. You know, you got capital cost, and um, you know, and you got to weigh that against it. So, but we we wouldn't have any of that. Obviously. Well, you would under you you, you would un, you would under village owned, but right, you would not. But un, not no, you wouldn't under right. uh, the other three options that are up there. You would right. not have any. Let, let me Why let me kind of let me kind of walk through the slides for you, and then you'll see what uh, what we're talking about. Jeez, I I wish I could make this bigger so I can see it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> We don't need to see the top of it, do we? No, you can. Is that a little better? 
Oh, I can see. I mean, I think folks. We have this rule. We have this rule in our office that the text has to be big enough I can see with my glasses off. But um, <laughs> oh, I'm I'm fine. Um, actually, I was doing it for everybody else. Um, so on a customer end, basically what we're going to go through here, what we kind of perceive is pros and cons. And, and there are more, there are additional pros and cons. I couldn't, you know, obviously I can't put everything on the list. And, and different people have different views of these. Some people may think what I think is an advantage is a disadvantage and vice versa. So, uh, but this is at least from our perspective what and we there see. Are advantages to some customers. That's right. Customers That's right. They may see it differently. Ability. We're looking at this more or less from the utility point of view, but, but also from the customer point of view as well. Uh, obviously, a customer, you know, one of the advantages is because those customers are private entities and they own the, the, the panels, as we understand, they currently would qualify for the 30% uh, investment tax credit um, for, you know, for the customer. The uh, other advantage is the customer would have the option to sell or retain SREX, and we talked about that earlier. If they wanted to keep them, they could, so they can say they've got green power, uh, or they could sell them and monetize them and get money out of them. Um, they would also have, uh, <coughs> well, we say again, from the utility perspective, we see it as a, an advantage in that there's no capital or operating cost for the village. So again, I'm kind of, I'm not just looking at the customer's point of view here, I'm looking at the utility's point of view as well. Right. So, so we see those as some of the advantages to the customer-owned approach. Some of the disadvantages are that there would be initial capital cost for the customer. Um, you know, obviously that's, uh, I mean, if I were a customer, I'd see that as a little disadvantage. Uh, you have ongoing operation and maintenance costs, or maintenance requirements anyway for the customer. Um, this next one is really kind of a utility issue, and that is you have variable energy credits based on actual output of the project. I mean, as we understand, uh, the idea is that customers can own different numbers of panels and have different shares of the project and get different percentage of output, uh, which creates some issues from the billing standpoint, makes it a little more complex billing arrangement uh, than maybe some of the other options. Um, I think we talked about this last time I was here, transfer of ownership issue. You know, what happens when somebody who owns those panels moves out of Yellow Springs? And now you've got these panels that are owned by somebody that's no longer a customer. And, and how do you deal with that? Uh, panel failures. You know, what if Joe Smith's panels don't work and he doesn't get them fixed? Does he get a percentage of the total project or does he get zero uh, until his panels get repaired? Or how do you measure what he got because you know, you're going to have a meter on every set of panels. I mean, uh, so you've got those issues to deal with. And then the last one is uh, this unsubscribed surplus issue. What if the project ends up with more power than it's a subscribed, and where does that power go? Because now who owns it, and, you know, what happens to it? So, so that's kind of some of the pros and cons we see, you know, with a the, with the customer-owned approach. It certainly can work, um, and, and, and by the way, it's being done in other places, so... So it's not an uncommon approach. Um, village owned, um, obviously some of the advantages there uh, for the customer anyway, there's no capital investment for the customer to make. Um, and the village does have tax exempt financing available. In fact, uh, what we've kind of considered is, you know, financing it through AMPS on behalf of loan program, which has a pretty low interest rate <laughs> instead of getting in their project. We're not sure if they'd like that, but hey, so be it. Uh, they do offer that program, and you can borrow money pretty inexpensively through uh, through AMP's program, uh, or you can issue your own you know your own financing at, as tax exempt. So you get a lower interest rate than probably the, the private uh, entities or a private owner would. Um, as we understand, as I said before, the village has a site available for a project, um, and this next bullet is really kind of our perception. It may not be everybody's, but but we see this really as being a case where you could have customers subscribe for their actual usage as opposed to subscribing for a fixed amount of capacity. In other words, um, one of the issues you're going to have if, if you allow, if you have variable amounts of credit, is there's going to be months when the customer gets more energy out of the solar than his usage is, and some months it may be less, and you've got to track all of that. What we're suggesting is, at least under this option, would be the customer could just say, I'll subscribe for all of my usage. And so he'll get billed for all of his usage at the rate tied to the solar, the community solar project. Um, saves a lot of headaches on the billing side, so it's certainly less complicated uh, because you don't have those variable output issues. Um, you don't really have any panel failure issues, especially if the village puts in a little more than what's subscribed. You know, I mean, it's the village panels, so it's, it's their project. Uh, and, and they'll just, you know, they'll deal with that. 
Uh, so you're not dealing with Joe Smith has these panels and Bill Clark has these and you know, whether they're working or not. Um, and you don't have a surplus issue because if there is surplus, it's just a village resource. So it just becomes part of the village's overall power supply resources, just like all those resources we talked about earlier. So could, that could potentially reduce what we buy off the grid. Yes, it would. It would. And, and, and again, it gets back to that thing. You're really not buying it from somewhere else and bringing it in. It's just reducing your load here. So it reduces what, you know, what you have to bring in from outside. So, uh, yeah, sorry. No, no, not yet. Almost. Yeah. Almost. Um, so those are some of the advantages we see the village on. Obviously, there are some trade-offs uh, in that the village does have the initial capital cost. So they're going to have to, you know, they'll have to pay for it to own it. Um, and the village doesn't qualify for, you know, income or, or tax credits, uh, you know, like uh, privately owned entities would. Uh, and the village would have ongoing operation and maintenance uh, issues to deal with, obviously, for the panels. So, yeah. So the question is about actually the part of the next model. How would, how would pricing work? You know, you talked about some of the, if anybody just described, say, I want my power to come from the community solar array. How would pricing work, and what happens when demand exceeds supply? Well, let, me do the, let me do the last one first. When demand exceeds supply, um, I, I would envision that you would limit the subscription so that it would not happen, okay? In other words, so, it, first come, first so it would be on a first come, first serve basis. I, you know, now, again, I don't know what the potential is for subscription. That's the kind of thing that you'd want to feel out first. Right. You know, you'd want to go to the customers and find, get a feel for that and say, you know, who would want to sign up for this? And, and, and just like AMP's going to do with their project, you got to find out are people willing to subscribe, and if so, and you got to give them an idea of cost. And let me go back to the first part. My, my feeling would be that the cost is going to be based on village's actual cost. So you're going to price it at what their cost is. Is it going to be their cost of, of you know, retiring the debt to the capital uh, and operation and maintenance cost, ongoing operation and maintenance cost. So, uh, but the village is not for profit, so they're not, Needing to make a profit, just like they don't on their, you know, on their service they provide now. So, right. I'm sorry. Oh. And um, Dord, one of the things that we had kind of discussed when we were talking about this was to find that tipping point of how many people could we subscribe at what rates, and then it would be first come, first served up to that point where it doesn't interfere with the finances. So. Yeah, and you'd you'd want to have a pretty good handle on that before you start construction. Nice thing about the village, though, is if they decide that they, I mean, from what I understand from the site you've got, it could probably support more than potential subscription. Mm -hmm. So you'd have the ability to expand the site if mm -hmm. you're down the road you get more subscription, too. So, yeah. Wouldn't an option be to just have the village build it, own it, and, not, and just as one of our sources of electricity, not get into having any particular resident buy? Yep, that's an option. Yeah, that's in fact, you do that now. You do that with, you know, with landfill gas. You do that with other pro, you know, other projects there. you're in. The, uh -huh. the, I, I guess from a, I'll put my customer hat on. The problem that I, as a customer, might have with that is, yeah, but you're blending in a lot of stuff that maybe I don't want. You know, like Fremont. Mm -hmm. You know. So it would be a service uh, to the customer who says, I so want to support solar that I want all my energy to come right. from solar. Well, yeah. And, and the, the discussion that Johnny and I had actually started out as a some of these contracts are going to fall off in the next seven to ten years, and what do we do to plan for the future as far as making that up or shaving our peak, what we buy off the grid, and that's where this discussion actually started. And then it kind of, as we got into it, more morphed into the, okay, well, what about doing our own community solar kind of thing? Yeah, and, and just so we're clear, I'm not suggesting that you do one or the other. You can do both. <laughs> I mean, you can do your own project as a village resource, and you can do a community solar portion of that that you allow customers to subscribe to and get the direct, you know, benefit cost associated with, uh, with solar, yeah. The other thing that this model here allows is it allows the homeowner to still put on their house if they choose to for the remaining part that we have a lot of. This would be above and beyond what we have allowed for solar right now. Well, that would be that would be a decision that would, be that would have to be made here. Yeah. So no, I, I'd say, I mean, you got to keep in mind the, the reason you've got a, the reason we recommended a limit and this body went with a limit was because, as you saw in some of the earlier presentation, 
you don't want to get yourself where you're overcommitted and you're selling back to the market, you know, at maybe at a loss. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we said you need to keep some of that that's just not committed, 10% or so. And you were at about 14, 15%, and your number is about right. So that's where the four and the one percent kind of fell out of, and that was based on numbers a couple of years ago. But, but again, that's that's how that was derived at was mm -hmm. trying to not push your commitments too high above the ninety you percent know, level, mm -hmm. and you were projected to be at that time anyway at about the eighty-five percent level. So yeah. Uh, for the seller, Uh, not necessarily. I don't know. Yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, but you got to keep in mind the village's rates include not only power supply costs, they also include delivery costs. Okay, so a portion of what you pay to the village isn't just power supply. A portion of it is delivering it to you, and that cost is still going to have to be recovered from the customer because you're still delivering the power to them. Okay, a little different than the behind the meter approach where the customer puts it on the roof, but here you're going to have to continue to recover that delivery cost and that ready-to-serve type cost uh, in your rate. So they're not going to see the whole energy charge fall off. In fact, under any of these options where, well, these last three options in particular, where if it's sized, if it's basically you're just charging them all their energy at the, you know, at the solar cost, you're still going to get the delivery cost over and above that. So there's going to be two components to the, what they pay. So it's not going to just be the solar. It's got to be solar plus delivery costs. Do you know of some particularly good examples of municipality-owned solar currently? Oh uh, well, there's some up on the East Coast. Um, none that I'm aware of in Ohio yet. Hmm. But I've got some other clients that have been having discussion about it, like you've been doing. Uh, so I don't know if there's any close by that have developed it. Uh, I know there are actually, um, and again, I'll be honest, I don't read all the solar news that goes on every day. If I did, I'd never get any work done in my office. Um, but I know that there are actually municipalities, um, and I think some even in Ohio that I've read, that are looking at doing this, and they don't even own an electric utility. So, um, and that's, so, you know, there's just a lot of activity out there. So, um, but I can't, I can't point you, none of our, I'll put it this way, none of our clients right. have, have done this, uh, but there are, are some that are certainly looking at can it. You, can so. you tell me who on the East Coast Owns Specific you. names? No, I, 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 can, I can get you some, though. Yeah, uh, there, there's a yeah. bunch of places in Vermont, yeah. places in, in Massachusetts and New York where the state law mandates utilities to be able to support this. Yeah. Um, yeah but they, have a, they have a renewable energy portfolio requirement, <laughs> so they have to do something. So. Does How does Oberlin? I'm sorry? How does Oberlin do it? How does Oberlin do? Solar. I think they allow their customers to buy RECs. I don't know that they're selling solar directly to them. No, I mean, they have a solar. They have a solar project. Right. That's their project, just like you, you talked about. It's, it's a village resource. I don't know that they're directly applying those costs to specific customers. Not that I'm aware of. Anyway. I don't do work for, for them, so. Okay. So the rate would include also the, the cost of the project and the cost of finance. The, the solar side would, yes, absolutely. And, yep. and the cost yep. for But there can be. <laughs> well, there could be. Yeah. And you also said you wouldn't know which panel was broken from the previous solution. And on my panels, I have an inverter on every panel, and I can look and see which panel is operating. Yeah, see, and you, you don't typically in the larger scale have that situation where every panel has a single inverter. You usually have a group of panels on an inverter. And, and the problem is, the point I was trying to make is if it's not, Tied, if all of that isn't tied to that particular customer owner, well, then how do I split it up? You know, that, that's where the complication comes. Yeah, let's get through these last couple. Uh, let's talk about the third-party PPA. Again, as I said before, this is a case where you've got a, an independent developer who is going to own and, and build the project. And, you know, in, in this case, we're kind of assuming anyway for discussion on a village site. Obviously, the advantage is there's no capital investment for either the customer or the village. Um, so... Uh, neither one of them are going to have to make any capital investment. Uh, but, uh, and that 
developers should qualify for the 30% 30, 30 tax credit as well as depreciation tax benefits. Those developers who built projects in those communities that I mentioned earlier are, have, have all taken advantage of both the tax credit or grants as well as the, they're t now taking advantage of the depreciation uh, tax benefits, which are pretty, uh, pretty lucrative for them. Um, another advantage would be that uh, you know, hopefully you could get a fixed energy rate for the term of the, of the power purchase agreement. And they're typically 20 to 25 years. Um, so you would really kind of know what, what that price is going to be instead of based on actual cost of the village, you'd actually know in the contract uh, what, that, what that number is going to look like. Um, again, the village has a site available, as we understand. Uh, like the other, the rest of these are pretty much the same as village owned. Customers can subscribe for actual usage. You know, again, less complicated billing, uh, no surplus or panel uh, failure issues. So I, I guess the, you know, the downside to this we see, and we've got this with clients who have these projects for themselves, is the risk of a third party default. You know, so you want to make sure if you're dealing with a third party that it's somebody that's reputable, somebody that's financially, uh, you, know, in, in, you know, in good shape. Um, and in fact, in those contracts, we typically require the uh, third party to also post credit or uh, surety. Uh, so if something goes wrong and we have to remove the system, you know, uh, we can get that done as well. So, so that's probably the biggest risk that we see to this approach. Um, but certainly, and again, there are certainly other advantages and disadvantages to this, but that's uh, you know, some of the key ones that we and see. The energy board looked at this particular option. Uh, all the research we did saw that, that there were no developers that were interested in the size array, I, usually a half a megawatt or above. I, I would agree with that, but we're finding that to change. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple developers right now in, in the state uh, one of which has panels that if he doesn't do something with them, he's going to lose his tax credits. He already bought them, and he's got to get them placed somewhere. And so there are, I think there's a potential for that. But, but yeah, 100 kilowatts might be a push, but 500 kilowatts where maybe the village assigns some of it to community solar and the rest is a, is a village project is, is probably doable. So, and, and it's some pretty attractive prices as well, I might say. Uh, probably lower cost than what you're going to see in this next option with AMP or lower cost possibly than if you do it yourself. So, uh, And that's primarily because they take advantage of all those tax benefits that you and, uh, and unfortunately AMP cannot. Um, on the AMP community solar, again, a lot of the same uh, advantages that you saw with, uh, you know, with the other two prior to. Uh, again, no capital investment for the customers of the village. Um, and AMP does have tax exempt financing. They are uh, just like their other projects could issue this uh, or finance this tax exempt. Um, the energy rate would be based on AMP's actual cost. So uh, whatever those costs end up being, and that's similar to what you have in your other power purchase agreements with AMP. Um, and again, I think the rest of these are all pretty much the same as what we saw in the prior ones. Uh, you know, the disadvantage of this approach, we don't really see the risk of default. I mean, if AMP defaults, we've got bigger problems than just a solar, 100 kilowatt solar project. Uh, so I guess you're already in, you're already in bed with them. <laughs> you know? um, another 100 kilowatts of solar isn't going to make a whole lot of difference. Um, but, you know, again, the, the, probably the biggest disadvantage for AMP is they don't qualify for the tax credits, uh, although they're trying to figure out a way to do that. And I'm not sure if they're going to figure out a way to do that. But um, it's pretty hard to have a tax-exempt entity get tax credits and get tax-exempt financing. But... Uh, hey, I've seen lawyers do crazy things. So, uh, but anyway, that's that's kind of our uh, you know, our summary on the uh, solar uh, community solar option. And again, there are other options as well that could combinations of these are for different uh, versions. So, okay, great. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions, citizens? I mean, we've been having kind of a give and take, so hopefully everybody has had their questions answered. Any council questions Not for right John? Now. Obviously, if we get questions, we can all email. Absolutely. Email you or if talk we to Patty let's, let's walk. Johnny. Let's let's take questions through Patty yeah, to Pat, John. I, mean, I noticed that we have several people from the Energy Board, and so I'm wondering if they either have questions or comments on this oh, presentation. I see that Pat has her hand up. Can you come up to the non-existent microphone? <laughs> Here, <laughs> he can share it with you. <laughs> Thanks for thank you. Thanks to all the citizens yeah. for thank sitting you. through the um, long yeah, presentations, I, lots of details. It, it's a totally different trajectory, but I think that in considering <clears throat> setting a, a base rate 
for electrical use and and i think we need to do that i think there's another issue that should be weighed along with the cost of electricity energy and along with the cost of demand and it's the other cost that nobody ever talks about the cost to the environment of using energy and i think that we need to think about how we can put this in as we make rates for electrical use. Um, three years ago, when we were looking at electrical rates, I, I found on the internet the um, way in which Dallas, Texas had charged rates for electricity to its now. We're here, they were talking about residents, they weren't talking about commercial. And rather than taxing at a higher rate for a less use and a lower rate for a higher use, they did the reverse. And so the less electricity you used, and they had it in, I think it was a three or five tier uh, scale, the less electricity you used, the less you paid. And the more electricity you used, the more you paid. And what it was looking at was not those demand costs, those all are figured in, but rather the other cost that's never mentioned, the cost to the environment by us using more and more and more energy. How do we give carrots and sticks to people who use electricity? Uh, if we have big houses, we use more electricity. If we use more electricity, we pay less. If we have a small house, we use less electricity and we pay more. Now I know I understand what Dave is saying in terms of the cost and all, but there's another cost that's never figured in. And it's the cost that we are doing to our children and to our grandchildren and to society by using more and more fossil fuels. Or even, even hydroelectric, which is using every one of our, including solar, we're all using energy of some form. Hopefully our green alternative energies are using less than that is in a hope, hopefully a lot less. But there's always a cost, and I think we need to begin to look at that other cost as we begin to study how we want to change rates. I think it's a very important consideration to use. I don't know how to do that, but I do know three years ago, I went on the internet because I was sort of interested when I thought we were going to look at rates. And I thought, oh, I wonder if anybody's doing that. And I did notice back then, and this was three years ago, that Dallas, the city of Dallas, did uh, had a rate that was based on actually the reverse of what okay. we're using. Okay, thanks, Pat. Thanks, thanks, Pat. Thanks, Pat. Sorry. And can you give your last name? I'm sorry. Uh, Brown. And can you give your name, please, sir? Yes. Sure, sure. Thank you. So are we, because we do, we still have a, I anticipate a short executive session, so we're not going to be done yet. Is council ready to um, make a motion? Is somebody ready to make a motion? Do we have any to go into executive session? Well, can I just ask, sure. do you want to give any, John, any basic direction on rates right now, or do you want to think about that and then run it through me back to him? How do you want to? Well, can we get it back to him? Why don't we make it a discussion item for Monday night? and we all come with our ideas. Okay. I think as, mu as much as these things can be done in public, the better. I don't like all of us emailing you what we right. think. It really has to be done in a public deliberation process. Okay. Process, And I don't know, that's a lot, it's been a lot of information right. to, s to sift through and on the spot tell him what, what What's, we should do. What kind of a schedule as far as, as getting this all done um, are you? I, I think, looking at. Well, I think my recommendation to council would be that we definitely consider passing. Well, you would pass that next time. Yeah. I think that's right. no. And then the rates, I think, I think mid, mid to late summer, John, to get the new rates. Yeah, I would, I would think that would work. If you get the, if you get the issue fixed with the power, with a 12 month rolling average and the power cost adder, um, I think you'll be okay given where the fund balance is. Um, it, it's not jump off the cliff time yet, but. But except for that adder, obviously, because that's big. That's a big issue. So, so if we look to potentially put put this piece of legislation on the agenda, a first reading for our May 
18th meeting, whatever the date is, May 20th. We can do a first reading. Why don't we May do the first? Do the do you want to do it with the rest of the legislation? Okay, then if, if everybody's good with that. I would like to put off this greater discussion, the further discussion, until our June work session. Okay. To me, mm -hmm. I think this, yeah. it makes sense for a work session. Are there some particular things we should be thinking about? Yeah, I, let, let, let me kind of lay out for you what, what we need feedback on in particular, right. and that's, that's revenue distribution. In other words, where do you, how do you want to distribute, well, two issues. First off, I guess, you know, the magnitude of overall revenue adjustment. Mm -hmm. We're recommending 9%. Um, you may have a different feeling about that, but, you know, that's what we recommended. Um, and secondly so is... 9% would be, like, right now we, we're charging $10. <coughs> well, yeah. But, but he's not recommending 9% yeah. across yeah. the board. The rate, rate guess, design could look a lot different. Um, yeah. the, the, so the overall magnitude of the, of the adjustment, and then how do you spread that amongst the classes, or what we call revenue distribution? How do you distribute that? adjust that re increase between residential, commercial, you know, and, and uh, large power classes. Right. And then once we have that information, then we can go back and work on rate design to meet those target revenue numbers and come back to you with some rate design suggestions. And in all honesty, I, I, I hear what you're saying about the inverted rates. Um, the problem, and, I, and I'm not saying it's not a bad idea, the problem is going from where you are to, to where you may want to get to may take some time. Um, that's why what we've been seeing clients do is to shrink those blocks and actually maybe even just go to a flat rate for now, which kind of moves you somewhat in that direction. So at least people feel a little more blunt of, you know, of using more. Um, and, and then somewhere down the road, you know, maybe look at that other option. But, uh, but yeah, get us the revenue distribution kind of numbers and then we can come so back with some rates for you. So. We could say in <laughs> five years we'd like to be at a place where where there might even be a penalty for right. for residential use sure you only yep. mm -hmm. and will you be looking at at how we go forward from here in into the future making recommendations for how we potentially adjust rates into the future yeah and, we, and we'll probably most likely talk about some sort of a phase in on some of these because uh, in particular, what we're going to, I can tell you right now, we're going to come back and tell you raise customer charges from that roughly three dollars implied in the minimum to a much higher number and again, you're not going to be able to do that overnight because that small user is going to see some real high impact. So, so there's always the transition. As I, as I tell people, rate design isn't a science, it's an art. Mm -hmm. And it's trying to transition from where you are to where you'd like to get to, but do it without having significant impacts on any customers. So, I mean, it's going to have some impact on some customers, but you don't want to have it so adverse that you know, customers see 40, 50, 60% rate increases. Mm -hmm. and, and something that's important to me, and I know it's important to everybody, is is the whole issue of energy efficiency. And yep. are you somebody, because, I mean, I know we're in efficiency smart, but I feel like we've got to be doing more because I think that that could help diminish the, the impact. I think it, it is our residential users and our small commercial users that are not taking advantage and that are getting hit they have energy and efficient well the key the buildings. key there the key there is to educate them about the program because there are a lot of rebates now amps expanded that program to include a lot more rebates back to customers mm -hmm. uh, you know for various uh, efficiency improvements it's not just fifty dollars for the old refrigerator anymore there's a multitude of different programs that they have available for you know residential and small commercial that was kind of the one of the things that the feedback they got from the first three years of that program was you know, customers are saying, well, everything's for the big guys, you know, the industrial guys and big commercials. And so they started to focus on the smaller uh, commercial residentials. And I think you'll find that, you know, there's some, some programs out there that your customers could take advantage. But okay. the, the key is education. Okay. It's really putting, I mean, it's not me. It's it, kind of educating the customers. So. Yeah, Dan. So could you, uh, council, give the Energy Board some feedback on the community solar uh, thing? We, you know, we evaluated these different things. The only, the only one that we didn't have on the table was and if the, you know, the, the other options are much better, especially if the villages are either willing to commit to debt with owning, uh, owning the actual installation or commit to power purchase agreements or increase the allotment for solar. But we need feedback. We, we got the impression when we started this out that the village was not interested in, in, in incurring any additional debt because they were very concerned over costs and, and mm -hmm. the budget as it was that the village was not interested in increasing, increasing the 5% because they were worried about the margin. And, and so we narrowed it down to the one 
the one solution that met all the requirements right. and didn't affect anything else. So just as when, far as if you want our recommendations, we need some feedback, I guess. I, I, you know, I, I don't know that we're prepared. I mean, th th that would require a lot more conversation, and I'm certainly not ready to sit here and discuss that, considering we still have an executive session. Um, what does everybody else think? Well, can we maybe just set a date for when we will have the discussion? Uh, what's, do we have a full agenda? I mean, we're Monday night. I don't even remember. It keeps growing. Yeah. Um, but, but one thing, you know, at, at the last meeting, we, we, we just heard Patty and John, Johnny gave us a, a, a brief proposal on Village Own, okay? Mm -hmm. and. Then John just kind of gave us some pros and cons, but I, you know, to me, if we're going to be looking at a village own, and and if that's feasible, it's going to take a little bit more discussion, I would believe. Uh, well, I just think we, I for one, am too tired. No, no, to no, think no, about, no, not even not, think right. about that tonight. No, not, no, so I think tonight. we need to no, I just hash tonight, all that but, out. But, um, but pick, picking picking a, a date because we got sidewalk I know. and so forth. So uh, it's just uh, the, what I, what the what the citizens have is they've got these expiring tax credits. So if this is going to happen, it kind of needs to happen fairly soon. And so that's why we need if we're going we need to have the discussion. And give them the yes. feedback right. because that that is expiring. And I, I think need we can respect that. I think so. we could probably add it to new or to old business Monday night. I, Monday night's okay. agenda, the big item obviously on the agenda is the utility um, delinquency mm -hmm. discussion. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And since it's our second reading of three, we could potentially cut that one a little short. Right. It won't mm -hmm. be an official public hearing. So um, I would recommend we consider doing that and. Yeah. Um, but this makes it much easier to even think this whole big presentation right, that yes. you did for us tonight, John, which was really excellent. Mm -hmm. I feel like I feel more informed about our electrical system than I've been since I've been on. Um, this was just an exceptionally good presentation. And it, for me, it really helps me to put solar, in, the, the, the different proposals into the mix and exactly where we are. Um, with everything. There's just so many moving parts with this kind of a, a thing. Right. And what I would say, uh, you know, I think we, if we put this back in the packet, John's presentation on community solar, <clears throat> and potentially get a little bit more information on what AMP's plans are, if they have anything ready to, to talk about. Yeah. And if we get, uh, I mean, yeah. we, what we have to think about is we've got this sort of set aside of like 1% that was supposed to be for people in the town to do this. And the, and so that is kind of a separate issue from what the village is supplying to the customers. You see what I mean? Right, well, I, I mean. so we just, I just, I, we, we, as we're thinking about it, we should be thinking about those are kind of two, they're related, but they're two different things. So um, um, I, I would just like to say, I, I think that, uh, I think the energy board needs to be acknowledged for pushing this forward because mm -hmm. I don't think that probably any discussion about local solar as happened tonight would have ha would have I don't think it would have happened if the energy board hadn't been working on the kind of project that they're proposing um, so I I think that the energy board I'd like to acknowledge the energy board for that and, and just say that given that council uh, was impressed with the climate action plan action presentation that the, I'll just speak for myself that locally produced renewable energy I would assume is going to be a value and what's the best way we need to decide but, right I I agree yeah mm -hmm. I and I will say again I would like I would like energy put into energy efficiency. I would like that to become a priority instead of just generation. Um, so can I have a motion to go into executive session? Uh, uh, I, Johnny. I'll just to give you a fast update while we're talking about electric. Uh, Alamon did finish the poll inspections. 
Uh, we have 1,598 poles in the village that we have electric on. Out of those, 158 of them, no, 152 of them were considered rejects and 62 of them considered priority rejects. So, uh, and we need to get this in and out. Right. 10%. Right. We started okay. replacing them last week. So okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks Johnny. a lot, Johnny. Thank Johnny. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have a motion? I move. Second. We go into executive session. Yes. For the purpose, the purpose of, of potential, potential litigation potential with our litigation attorney with present via our, telephone. Oh. Okay. Is Second. that allowed? Yeah. Sorry, Brian, you second it? Yes. 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 Yes.